So good morning, um, everyone who's watching, uh, everyone who's joining, uh, audiences on Facebook um, and uh, participants on Zoom. Um, I'm Ananya Vajpay. I'm in New Delhi at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. And we are um, hosting a two day round table um, from the center, uh, broadly based on uh, the theme of populism and minorities, uh, which is um, uh, going to focus on uh, four or five recent volumes that uh, many of us have contributed to, have written, have edited, uh, and that sets up a really broad spectrum dialogue uh, uh, involving disciplines uh, across the social sciences and the humanities. Um, I'll, of course, introduce the speakers. I'll introduce uh, the volumes that are uh, under discussion and in conversation with one another as we go along. But I did want to uh, flag the fact that we have um, a range of uh, disciplines and um, disciplinary intersections that are going to be represented here, uh, both today and tomorrow. Um, there's, of course, political science, first of all, which is uh, in some cases more empirical, in other cases more conceptual. Uh, political theory, literary theory, intellectual history, political philosophy, comparative politics, political psychology, political sociology, all of these um, different kinds of um, uh, lenses are going to be um, uh, on display uh, and of course in dialogue with one another while we look at these two very significant themes of our times, uh, of the politics of our times um, across the world, uh, and especially the democratic world uh, uh, in South Asia, but also in, in, in the West and in other parts of, 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 the, of the globalized world. Um, my own um, sort of engagement with this subject um, um, began um, through uh, a series of meetings and conferences uh, which were hosted in Italy and in India um, uh, by, again, a range of institutions, but on the Italian side, sponsored mostly by a Reset Dialogue on Civilizations, um, which is based in Milan. A lot of the conferencing was uh, happening in uh, Venice at the University of uh, Venice, Ca Foscari, uh, also at the University of Padua. Um, and uh, the co-editor with me of a conference volume, uh, which we published last year, um, uh, Volker Kaul, uh, who will be uh, joining us tomorrow. He um, is based in Rome at uh, Lewis, uh, at, at the Guido Carli uh, University there, a political philosopher and a good friend of mine. So this is actually an engagement that has been evolving over many years, uh, starting as early as 2012 uh, uh, in, in, in the case of our collaboration. And others who will speak today uh, and tomorrow uh, have similarly had their own trajectories and their own journeys as to how they've arrived at um, uh, a focus on uh, populism, on minorities, and always relatedly, uh, although it is not named necessarily in our topic, uh, majoritarianism, uh, which is also a very uh, a common concern across uh, the four or five volumes that, that uh, we are uh, discussing. Um, in the majority of the cases that we are going to be looking at, over these two days, uh, our focus will be on South Asia, on India and Pakistan mostly, um, uh, and uh, 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 to a lesser extent uh, on, on Western Europe, on, on the democracies of Western Europe. Um, but in, in a broader perspective, we have actually had uh, the conversation um, uh, uh, in, a, in a much more comparative, robustly comparative sense uh, with, uh, with the entire Anglo-American world, where we have seen um, a resurgence of right-wing 
uh, regimes of, of, of populist strongmen, um, uh, democratic authoritarianism, and uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 a growing illiberalism, uh, which had really reached a kind of uh, apotheosis uh, in in a in a figure like Donald Trump, um, who uh, luckily is no longer um, uh, the president of the United States as of just a few months ago, um, and so um, so this kind of a broad. Uh, you know, framework is something which is always in the back of these discussions. But I think a lot of the papers are going to be very, very specific and particular, uh, looking at particular communities, looking at particular regions, looking at particular historical moments, um, and uh, particular political configurations, sometimes even political uh, figures uh, as individuals, for example, in, 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 in my own essay in, in, in our volume. Um, uh, so this will this will be all over the place, and 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 that actually, in my view, uh, makes the discussion more interesting, I hope, uh, and also more fruitful for for uh, those of us who are uh, who don't otherwise share uh, a disciplinary um, set of assumptions. Um, I. Um, I, I would say that normally we would have had, uh, you know, if, if it was, wasn't pan a pandemic all over the world, uh, you know, we would have had uh, probably, you know, five different conferences and uh, had a chance to uh, invite speakers uh, uh, who have contributed to all these volumes because the total number adds up to a very large number of speakers. Uh, but we are so scattered and uh, we are so uh, bound to our locations that uh, this is about what we could manage uh, 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 about eight or ten of us uh, spread out over two days uh, virtually uh, in conversation. Um, the volumes that we are looking at have been published uh, between uh, late 2018 and uh, 2020. Um, so um, uh, over three years, um, and some of them have already had, uh, you know, uh, uh, successful careers in the world, and some are, um, uh, some have uh, are relatively new and have also had less exposure again because of the pandemic and because of the suspension of normal academic life uh, for all of us in 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 whatever part of the world we happen to be in. Um, I'm particularly excited uh, personally uh, that many of my own colleagues here at CSDS uh, are simultaneously involved in many of these projects, including Professor Peter D'Souza, um, um, uh, who uh, is now uh, in Goa at Goa University, uh, uh, Hilal Ahmed, um, uh, Sanjeer uh, Alam, um, uh, myself. I mean, we we you know, I mean, we are we are literally. Uh, in, in the same building, uh, but really uh, bringing to bear whatever skills we have uh, from our very different vantages uh, on these questions. Um, and we also have colleagues from uh, JNU, uh, from Jamia, um, from um, uh, so many other universities, uh, from, from King's College London, from uh, Sciences Po in Paris, um, uh, and, and a number of uh, Delhi University uh, and a number of other institutions, which I will not be able to uh, name today because speakers aren't necessarily, um, um, uh, you know, uh, able to uh, join from all these places. Um, but this is a truly uh, uh, sort of uh, global uh, discussion, and 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 that reflects the fact that. Populism as a as a phenomenon, uh, majoritarianism as as a political uh, sort of wave, tidal wave, uh, uh, you know this kind of uh, extreme right wing nationalism. Um, um, it's it's something that has hit the world um, uh, uh, almost like this pandemic uh, at once. Uh, and and has has completely you know changed the rules of the game uh, as far as uh, even even democratic uh, uh, stability uh, electoral politics uh, and uh, especially of you know uh, forms of 
uh, accommodation and coexistence uh, in very, very diverse and plural societies uh, like India, but like uh, many, many other democracies uh, around the world. Um, so we see a kind of uh, uh, contradiction uh, emerge in, in many, many countries uh, between um, uh, stated and established political conventions uh, of dealing with diversity and difference, uh, accommodating identities um, and uh, ensuring rights uh, uh, regardless of numerical, uh, uh, you know, presence of different communities, um, a contradiction between those principles of liberal democracy and um, uh, real-time politics, where um, uh, populist leaders and uh, uh, right-wing uh, movements and parties uh, have tended to capture the state um, and um, differentially represent uh, the interests. Of, uh, of majority communities uh, relative to minority communities. Now, just one uh, thing I'd like to flag, uh, which is, um, I think, a common concern, again, across all these uh, conversations. Um, and that has to do with uh, uh, Muslims, especially as a, a kind of uh, uh, minority on, on which there is a an extraordinary focus um, uh, in all in all respects, uh, in almost all the cases that we are dealing with uh, in our in our discussions. Um, uh, certainly, this is the case in India, but this is also the case in many countries in Western Europe. Um, of course, there is a difference in how Muslims are minoritized, uh, whether as citizens uh, or as immigrants. Um, whether as, uh, you know, already always present uh, within a diverse social fabric uh, or as uh, newly, uh, uh, newly arrived, um, uh, you know, pockets uh, and um, uh, in, in, in a variety of, 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 of uh, sort of um, uh, identities in a sense uh, coming from uh, uh, the Middle East, coming from Africa, coming from South Asia into Europe. Um, and carrying in many instances long histories of conflict, of religious conflict, uh, which is specific to, uh, to Europe and to the Middle East um, between um, uh, different religious communities, uh, uh, especially Christians and Muslims. Um, in India, it's a very different context, of course, uh, with, with a Hindu majority and um, uh, Muslim minority, um, uh, the history of partition, um, our neighbors, Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, which are Muslim majority. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, um, a certain assumption about uh, a secular structure, uh, which is constitutionally mandated, um, uh, which, which, uh, which, which leads to certain expectations, which are then belied. Uh, by uh, an increasing majoritarianism um, and uh, a bid from from the ruling powers to in fact alter the character of the of the Indian state uh, into a majoritarian uh, uh, Hindu Hindu dominated state. Um, so this is a, a very different history than what we see in Europe, uh, where immigrant communities are. Uh, are recent, uh, post-war certainly, but at the same time, um, uh, the dialogue with and the conflict with uh, uh, between Islam and, and Christianity and uh, uh, and Judaism um, are are very long-term uh, frameworks, uh, which which are which are which look very different if historically treated. Um, so uh, that said, um, I will um, you know. Um, sort of uh, nudge us towards um, keeping in mind the fact that we are trying to juggle uh, all these different uh, factors uh, in, in our discussions. And that sometimes those discussions, um, you know, are not particularly coherent. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, for example, when we, when we had a systematic uh, attempt to address uh, populism and minorities uh, in Europe, especially during our meetings in, in which were held in Italy uh, over, over many years, um, you know, we found that uh, uh, the, the historical experience was so different uh, and the 
a constitution of uh, nationalities, of ethnicities, of religious communities, and of uh, citizenship uh, was was so different in South Asia versus in Europe that, uh, you know, there were very few scholars who could actually discuss both at the same time. Uh, I mean, what ended up happening is that mostly people would focus on, you know, their, their part of the world or a set of countries that they had worked on, um, uh, which was not necessarily their part of the world. For example, uh, uh, Professor Jafralo, Christophe Jafralo has, has spent his whole life working on South Asia, uh, even though he's sitting in France and he's working in France, in, in the UK and in the United States. Um, still, his, his uh, focus is very much, uh, you know, on, on South Asia. So, so it's not that there's necessarily a correlation between, uh, you know, our identities and our field. Uh, but uh, a kind of uh, coherent and cogent uh, discussion, uh, which is truly comparative uh, and which, which actually is able to take into account historical particularities and historical differences um, and uh, political contexts that are incommensurate uh, or that are um, you know, dissimilar, uh, that is really hard to achieve. It's really hard to achieve. It's much harder than even the kind of disciplinary crisscrossing that uh, that you know will be uh, attempted through this kind of a roundtable. Um, so um, you know, I, I would I would urge everyone to to be patient and and to listen uh, when um, other scholars are speaking who are not from our uh, framework, who are not from our discipline, who are not from our country, who are not from our region, um, but nonetheless have something to say on these very important phenomena um, that have um, you know. Uh, both been with us in, in, in different guises for a long time, but have really come to a head, I would say, in, in the second decade of, 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 the, of the 20th century, of the 21st century, I beg your pardon, um, after an early <laughs> career in, 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 in the early part of the, of the 20th century, um, in, 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 um, in, in what was then a largely um, colonial and, and imperialist world. Um, uh, they continue to remain with us even in a in a post-colonial world, um, um, and and we have to take them into account. I also want to um, say that uh, you know populism is not necessarily only right wing. Uh, there has also been uh, left wing populism uh, in 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 many different uh, political and uh, historical and cultural contexts. Um, and uh, you know that that may or may not also come up for discussion depending on uh, how you know people decide to 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 uh, present their work and that of their colleagues. Um, and um, I should also say that um, in many cases we have um, very empirical, almost anthropologically based um, uh, accounts that are available. Uh, uh, you know of the impact of populist leadership of strong men, um, of, uh, uh, you know, bellicose nationalism uh, on particular communities and particular regions, especially those which are at odds with the state, uh, for example, in India's Northeast uh, or uh, in Kashmir. Uh, these are things which have been addressed in, in, in these volumes as well. Um, I don't want to speak for others, but I think uh, in Professor Prashanta Chakravarti's uh, volume, um, there, there, there may be more literary, aesthetic, uh, and intellectual historical reflections um, on uh, really basic uh, ideas of modernity, um, um, uh, including how to look at crowds, how to look at power, how to look at the mob, uh, you know, how to look at lynching, uh, all of these kinds of phenomena which have very particular instantiations today uh, in majoritarian politics, uh, in minority persecution, uh, and in populist sort of uh, spectacular politics uh, everywhere in the world, uh, but, but also have long histories uh, in the modern West um, uh, and 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 have hidden histories perhaps in 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 the context of South Asia uh, via partition and so on. So these are issues that uh, will also come up. 
um, and uh, I'd I'd invite you to to be attentive uh, as you as you listen to different papers uh, to see how uh, how these different thematics emerge and uh, coalesce uh, and and come into conversation with one another. So um, I'm going to begin um, today's proceedings. Um, and I will introduce our first speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Prashantha Chakravarti. Um, he is uh, uh, at the Department of English at the University of Delhi. Uh, he's very widely published, uh, and uh, he has uh, very modestly stated that his interests lie in political philosophy and literary criticism. Uh, he's also a poet. Uh, and he's also a, 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 a passionate and committed uh, teacher, uh, 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 and and uh, very involved with uh, with with uh, with the students, with his university, and with uh, the growing crisis in 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 Indian academia. Um, he's here today. Actually, this whole conference, I should I should say, uh, in a sense, was his idea. Uh, because he said to me many, many months ago uh, in the thick of the lockdown last year that, you know, he had this volume, I had this volume uh, together with Volker and, and he said, you know, why don't we do a joint book event? And at that time we thought that, uh, you know, we could actually do a physical event, uh, but it's taken so many months for us to even get our heads around the fact that uh, it's not possible to do uh, a physical event. So in a sense, uh, it was Prashanta who instigated this, uh, this whole plan, who hatched this plan as it were. Um, and um, he is the editor of one of the volumes that we are uh, are going to be uh, sort of uh, celebrating in a sense today. Um, um, it's uh, it's called Populism and Its Limits After Articulation. Um, it's published by by Bloomsbury. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's come out in, technically speaking in 2021, uh, um, but of course he had uh, circulated uh, to friends and colleagues. Um, you know, it's 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 complete manuscript uh, last year itself. So, uh, uh, Dr. Chakravarti will be speaking on um, um, the the honorable mob. Uh, that's the title of his paper today. Um, what I'm going to do in each case is I'm going to ask and invite our speaker to be uh, to take no more than perhaps 20 minutes of their allotted half hour. And then um, if there are questions and people can, um, you know, send them to us uh, in the chat, uh, then uh, we will uh, try to, uh, you know, pose them to the speaker and have a, have a chance for, for Q&A and for discussion. And other speakers are also invited to, to ask uh, questions. It's not just uh, members of the audience, uh, since it's hard to keep track of really who's out there in, uh, in, in this kind of an event. So uh, this is Prashantha's book, uh, and uh, I will invite him now to please uh, begin speaking. Prashantha. Hello. Good morning to all of you. Am I visible and audible? That's the customary question. Yes. OK, so in that case, I'll start. Ananya, um, thank you very much for uh, for your uh, great introduction, you know, uh, it's a complicated theme and you got some of the uh, issues and the, and, the, and the problems there. My own book is, as Ananda has already said, you know, it's a, an edited volume. So uh, it's a, a group of people coming together and primary as Ananda has rightly said, more to do with uh, political philosophy, literary concerns, uh, psychology and, and philosophy proper. Uh, uh, so in, uh, in the way uh, some of us were trying to understand the, not just the contemporary manifestations of populism, which is right, but also uh, populism as a mode, as a primal, as a recurring impulse in, uh, in human and uh, in fact creaturely interaction. Uh, that, was the, that was the motivation behind the volume. And, but today I speak for myself uh, uh, and uh, not for my friends and contributors, and uh, following Ananda's largesse, uh, she has given me a white bird to speak. I'll take advantage of that and 
uh, I'll not actually speak about the uh, about the sociological category of minorities. My friends, my co-panelists can do that much better, I'm sure. And then I have already started the process, but I'll more I'll look more at, at an idea of a group of people whom I'm calling honorable mob, uh, looking actually at the cultural bourgeoisie of our times and how how the cultural bourgeoisie react in times of acute polarization of society. And in times, uh, in fact, what I would like to see our times not just uh, polarized in, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in two ways, but in many ways, there is a very interesting subterranean civil war that is going on almost and it's going to last for a long time, I think. So uh, in populism studies, as we all of us know, as Anena has already said, it's customary to look at either right-wing populism or left-wing populism. I'm not going to do either, but I'm going to look at this uh, concept of which comes in mind, which I'm calling in this book, Populism Light. And this populism light is something that I want to uh, you know, unfurl and, and think about in terms of what this oxymoronic title of mine, the Honorable Mob. Now to begin with, I just want to begin with a, with a lovely poem by uh, one of our foremost contemporary Hindi poets, Ram Kumar Chetan Kranti. It will be in Hindi. We can see that. Can we see that? But I'm going to translate that in English as I go on. So can we have that on the screen, the, the poem by Chetan Kranti, please? Well, uh, it, it, it is coming, I'm sure it will be on the screen in a short, short while, but you know, uh, the poem goes like this. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, give you the English version, the translated version of it. It, it says, um, how much must you have loathed me? I think and shudder when they took my name and impaled you, scorned you, must have shredded your whole existence, trampled all over it, halting, hopping, plunging, all over your thrall, the crowd must have thronged. Radical crowd is its honorable name. I know how much hatred you must have felt, first for me and then for yourself. Laughing, chortling, sniggering, climbing, leaping, hissing, growling, they must have arrived on bikes and cycles, in cars, on horses and chariots, just to tell you how much and in what ways you have erred that your very being is in question that we cannot fathom who and why and what you are. And that, and so you no longer have the right to love. You have been accepted, chosen and received, like water you have must have stirred, like water clean and sacred, bewildered and wide-eyed, silent and shaking. Alone on this desolate earth, like a lake brimming over. Victorious on the 30-inch highway when they conducted a flag march announcing we are progressives, strictly against mob lynching. So shall not kill you, but leave you free, rehabilitate yourself. How forlorn you must have felt, been felt. How lonely and forsaken, numb. I want to especially concentrate on, I'll come back to this poem, but especially the penultimate lines. When he says, announcing we are progressive, strictly against mob lynching. So shall not kill you, but leave you free, rehabilitate yourself. These are the you know, uh, brilliant lines which I want to unfurl if, if, if uh, you allow me. Now I'll take a roundabout way to do that. We can, we can uh, have the screen removed. Now I'll come back to the poem later in this talk. I'll take a roundabout way and actually go back across culture, across time and space and go back to 17th century England, which may not seem like have a direct connection to our contemporary times so in the early 18th century, but I'm, I'll demand that there is a uh, there's a very interesting way of looking into a particular tribe of people whom we, whom we think as humanists and, and, and liberals. And when, uh, when, when liberals come at crossroads with, with highly polarized times, in times like that we are passing through right now, in times of terror, in times of uprising, in terms of unrest, uh, there's a very interesting dilemma uh, that one can see in them, which starts right from, from the inception of, of liberalism that how to accommodate the rights of man and, and demands of civility with, with the methods of violence. So, uh, uh, so particularly if the violence is some kind of white rage of righteous paranoia uh, playing out itself in, in mass politics, both from the right and the left, as Ananya has already pointed out. So um, the liberalists 
supposed to be avowedly uh, uh, taking individualism uh, as sanctified category, but it is a category of faith and belief in the civitas. Uh, when I use the word faith and belief, I don't just mean religious faith. I mean the very category of, of, of faith, fideism, as opposed to doubt, as opposed to curiosity, as opposed to questioning, criticality. So there is some kind of you know, indeterminate inconclusiveness about the effective and irrational impulses of human interaction uh, that the liberals have not fully worked out. So from time to time, we would see that they'll indulge sometimes in a very embarrassed and defensive form of sophisticated quasi-hysterical kind of populism, which sometimes go directly against their vaulted tenets of rule of law or objective evaluation, diversity, and most importantly, communicative reason. So uh, the result is that uh, liberals often in times of polarization cannot fully join the populists, nor can they be true to the classical tenets of liberal thought, which are themselves thin and ideological, non-ideological. Sandwich dot, thus, there is a kind of a pathos, a sentimentalized pathos uh, uh, that we see in liberals and uh, uh, a kind of behavioral pathos that we see. And that is what I think is something that one should uh, understand in times of how 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 liberals are are, are, are trying to understand the, the, the phenomenon of populism uh, and even fascism in our times. You know, two small things here from the late seventeenth century. John Locke's uh, uh, great text, uh, Second Treatise of, of Civil Civility, and and, and there uh, the last chapter. I would like to deal with that and talk a little bit about that, which will uh, bring, uh, put forth some light into the idea of populism light. Now populism light, I should say right at the outset, as I see, uh, wants to keep the zone between social process and social breakdown amorphous and malleable. Uh, second point, it helps to foster and maintain a climate of uh, severe behavioral moral boundaries functioning within the bonds of certain kinship uh, loyalty ties. But it also allows, by allowing freedom to individual agents. Uh, let me explain what I want to say. Uh, it's, it's, it seems like it's very breezy and blithe, and therefore I use the word light, but there's a kind of very interesting ruthlessness, which is wrapped in decorum. In case I use the word decorum advisedly, but this is a beginning of, of liberalism, decorum and politeness is something very important. To, to understand as communicative behavior uh, trait. Now, if you see chapter 19 of Second Treatise of Civil Government in Locke, which is um, the famous of the dissolution of government, you would see Locke is not very sure about how, what he thinks about dissolution of government, whether dissolution of government is allowed or not, although he's quite gung-ho about it, but there are certain questions that, that immediately comes to our mind as we read that chapter, the 19th chapter. To begin with, uh, He's the role of the majority, which will topple a rightful government. Locke is quite, uh, you know, uh, supportive of that. But he's also not sure about if you dissolve law, what happens? You know, whether dissolution of is only of a political form of government or the civil society per se is dissolved. That is the first question one should ask. Uh, once dissolved, whether human beings should return to a state of nature or a state of war constantly. Uh, uh, you know, prevails in, within civil society in time, times of polarization. Uh, the third question would be about the nature of factional politics, the nature of sectarian conspiracy that happens in times of polarization. Uh, and then how, how often those revolts would be repeated. These are the questions that Locke has not fully answered, but given us some cues. And we see there's a kind of, you know, very purposeful vacillation, if one can use another oxymoron in case of, of law uh, uh, at, 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 uh, at many points in this chapter. He wants to overturn the, the, the government and he's okay with that. And at the same time, he, he, he understands that the overturning will mean the society will become what he calls entire free and independent and people are at the disposal to use their will. So there's a very subjective, absolute subjective, massified possibility of decision-making that comes here. So, one, so the first conclusion that one can draw is to whether one is reverting to a state of nature when Locke is talking about breakdown or whether one is still within civil society. So um, he's unsure. 
Uh, therefore, very famously, Leo Strauss has said, you know, Locke teaches on one hand that society can exist without government, and on the other, that society cannot exist without government. So there's a, uh, a conundrum there. The second point in this chapter is about nonviolent resistance. Locke knows that resistance of this kind or, you know, fomentation or majoritarianism would, would be violent, it's bound to be violent, and yet he wants to uh, take a route which is nonviolent uh, in a situation where law does not work, uh, but he has not given us the blueprint how that would happen. Uh, uh, this is the second sort of, you know, uh, aporia, if one can call that in that chapter. The third is about the most important, I think, is about internecine, you know, struggle in times of, of polarization, especially among the, in, among the centrists who are unsure which way to go. So, uh, so uh, Locke knows that there will be opportunists and mercenaries, which he calls uh, that these are the people there will be busy heads and turbulent spirits, turbulent spirits, that is what he's called. But still he gives them enough leeway to, to dissolve the government. Uh, so again, he, is, he doesn't go the whole hog and talk about what exactly what he calls intestine broils or internecine struggles in times of highly polarized uh, uh, you know, climate, both civil and political. Uh, um, we also know that Locke has a particular distrust of the mass, of the people as a category. Uh, uh, mass is callous, mass is, uh, has a lot of inertia. So uh, if you have to have the popular support, you have to have the mass and yet there has to be a bourgeois vanguard who will take decisions during the times of resistance. That's what uh, one one gets, I think, in that in that chapter, the mass will suffer more, but will not take will not be resolute, resolute and therefore others have to take the decision. Uh, this is one side, the political side of of the liberal who is uh, who is unsure about what what exactly one should do politically, whether one should resist or whether one should you know be silent uh, during times of polarization. What what would the their relationship would be with, with the minorities, for example, is is not very uh, worked out properly. But there's another coordinate which I want to highlight here. It's the other side of it, which I have already mentioned. Is this category which uh, begins in the late 17th century, but comes to fruition in the early 18th century in Europe and then moves uh, all across the world through colonial means, one would think. Is the category of, of, of feeling, this category of, 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 of sentiment. Now, this is also very, very interesting. Locke's friend and um, you know, partner, in, uh, in, in, in all sorts of political acts. Uh, I'm thinking of third Earl of Shaftesbury, Anthony Ashley Cooper. And who I think is a bit just before Hutchison and see that in Shaftesbury, we see this very interesting category of sentiment coming into play. And that the idea of politeness seems to almost supplement the idea of philosophy in, 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 in Shaftesbury. And he is someone who is creates category of, of a certain kind of behavioral goodness uh, that is will be the hallmark of, of liberals, you know, um, along with communicative action. You have politeness itself as a form of liberty, as a category. Uh, and then it will lead to this whole questioning of empathy and so on and so forth, which we are seeing a return now in a very interesting way in, in our times, which is a you know, powerful behavioral way. Now, this means, you know, if you move into this idea, connect this political resistance with the act of civic, the civility. The idea of, of course, the idea of civic is very different, as you know, in republicanism, for example, it will have the categories of, you know, uh, celebrate the categories of heroic austerity or public mindedness or martial qualities. Those are gone. Those are gone. And now we have politeness in lieu of. So this is, this, this could work. In ordinary times, so this kind of thing can work, you know, but in our times where actually actual masks are out, we see that in terms of populist mass politics, it's very difficult to bring together this oxymonic honorable mob, this category of this liberal revolutionary, which is an oxymonic term, which fumes and stutters and practices that silence and begins to support clandestine resistive measures without taking full responsibility for the bloodletting and loss involved in times of purging. Now, um, so this, this is something that I think, uh, you know, it, to cut a long story short, we can come now to the poem, back to the poem. And can we again have the, have the poem here uh, and see how this category is, you know, Chetan is trying to bring out this in a way through his, through his poetry, the kind of you know, political thoughts that I have read. Of course, he has not referred to any of this, but I think there's something chimes here with the way Chetan is trying to 
understand uh, this idea of outrage, uh, uh, outrage, uh, re repeated outrage without actually taking responsibility for those outrage and without actually getting into the polity into action, as it were, from a large number of people. Uh, now, this is the honorable mob that I'm talking about. If you see that poem, you will see that it's a very interesting triangulated situation in the, in the particularly in the Hindi version. The speaker is trying to portray a situation where there's a horde of people, what he calls radical crowd, have descended upon a woman, trying to forcefully caution her against the speaker. And by doing so, puts a question on the very basis of her relationship with her. And the mob is raising a certain doubt you know, um, about, the, uh, about the category of love within a certain kind of minority politics. And there's a kind of, as we move on, as we read the poem further, we see if the crowd, the nature of the crowd is changing. There's a kind of strange negotiation that's underway. Uh, now that is the very interesting time, the crowd that Chetan has given us. The crowd is not just boisterous, but the crowd is trying to teach the woman a certain kind of lesson much more surreptitiously. The seemingly rational crowd, you know, is trying to tell that the speaker and the woman has done something about it. And yet, uh, uh, they are trying to say that how, how can they rage because they are rational, you know, thoughtful people of feeling, how can they negotiate rage? Now, is it possible to negotiate rage? You know, is it possible to be reasonable with anger? That is the question. But the crowd is precisely trying to do that. And at one point, Jethan says, she has been accepted, chosen and received. This is very telling that this, this woman is already chosen, already received by the liberal, liberal tribe. And there's, there's a kind of deterministic scenario here. This is a very interesting, very cold, brutal, velvet gloves are being offered to her. And she can only refuse the refuge of the tribe at her own peril. We immediately realize that there's a different kind of subternian psychological warfare that's going on. It's a thinking, thinking crowd, the crowd that, we, that, that comes from this Locke shops very kind of sensibility. It's neither fully resistant and yet, you know, deeply sentimental uh, uh, mob that, that we are talking about. And therefore, what, what the mob does? The mob leaves the woman free. You know, it's very interesting. A mob would usually kill or maim or, or, or do something horrible. But this thump, what kind of thumping mob leads the victim walk free? This is precisely what Chetan is trying to tell us. The, we understand there's a price for her freedom. The price for her freedom is rehabilitation. That is a ransom that she must secure. That is a trap the civil society lays for her at this point of time when the, when the times are absolutely polarized and the civil war is going on. So it's a very wily, wily mob that, that we see, a much more clandestine and wily affair that's going on in times of, of crisis. That is the liberal type's contribution to populism proper, I think, therefore populism light. Uh, so there is no scope of manifestation of anger. As a result, the light mode of populist righteousness makes the victim, as we see in the poem, bewildered and makes the, makes the person silent, what Chetan poetically calls brimful like a lake. She is not truly a pariah, a living dead within the bounds of civility. Now, this idea of tactfulness, this idea of generosity and acceptance and silence is something that I think some of us in our book are we're trying to understand as limits of populism. Okay. So, uh, and, and what is this idea of outrage and panic, this politics of outrage and panic, which I'm suggesting starts right from 17th century and has traveled all over. In times where one needs resolute action, what is that doing to, to our, uh, our uh, lives, our families, our friends, our uh, intimate partners, or uh, our political climate? That is something one, one should uh, take seriously, especially in times which full of social segmentation, sudden fraud, and resent, resent, resentment of all kinds. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Am I supposed to take some questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, uh, uh, for your uh, for your very very uh, well timed uh, piece where you spoke exactly for twenty minutes. Thank you so much, and you've got us off to uh, an exemplary start. Um, I have. Uh, I see. 
I see a lot of participants and, and maybe people would like to uh, actually ask their questions by voice. But in the Q&A box, we had one question uh, by uh, uh, Garima Tripathi, um, who says, is there any such thing as good populism? Right? How far is it appropriate to associate populism solely with negative aspects? when it also serves to address the democratic needs of the masses, right? And, and this is true both of, I'm, I'm, I'm adding, you know, left and right uh, kinds of varieties of populism. Um, after all, people uh, have, a, have a stake in it and they, uh, you know, they are the populace uh, of whom, uh, you know, this, this populism is a reflection. Uh, the honorable mob, as you as you as you started out by saying. So, uh, would you like to address that, uh, 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 Prashanta? Please, thank you. Thank you, Anna. thank you very much. Meanwhile, I'd I'd, um, I'd encourage uh, others who are on Zoom uh, to to please uh, either type in your question in the Q and A or to raise your hand, maybe, so that uh, if possible, I could uh, you know I could I could ask you to speak if you would like that. If, if I may uh, respond to that question, and then uh, Garima, thank you for the question. That is, you know, that's an excellent question, of course, you know, but, you know, I, I, there could be possibilities by uh, uh, where mass is, is, is taking some, you know, spontaneous but good decisions. But the, the, the point that uh, one would try to make is that, and that, that's the title of our, uh, subtitle of our book, After Articulation. You know, one can articulate things, you know, and that's perfectly all right, and that one should. Uh, but, you know, we are talking about uh, uh, what happens after that. You know, we sit across the table after that, we take same decisions. There are some long term effects of certain decisions. Uh, uh, and if you do that, you do that, uh, you know, uh, either you take this side or you take some decisions which I was trying to say, which is spontaneous, which is, which is anarchic. You're all right with that. I think that is the useful. Anarchism is a very powerful uh, political philosophy. But this halfway thing, this honorable mob business, is what I was trying to say, to talk about. Actually, uh, Prashanta, if you if you don't mind, I I mean I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, I think you Please. and I are the only uh, participants in this this whole. <laughs> business who are not political scientists and we are both literary scholars in a sense uh, and we are both interested in intellectual history and uh, you know we've, we've uh, I, as, as you know I mean thanks to you we've also been trying to read some po philosophy political philosophy together over the last uh, few months so um, I was, uh, in a sense, when you know, when you approached me and you said that you had this volume, I was actually uh, surprised because all the literature that I was familiar with was really, uh, you know, coming straight up from political science and political theory, uh, and 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 I would often feel very kind of uh, sort of. Uh, uh, like an odd man out in this in this entire uh, kind of spectrum of my colleagues and interlocutors, uh, and I don't speak their language in some sense, nor do they speak mine. Uh, so in that sense, I felt a great affinity, you know, with you and with with your interests and and where you were coming at this question from. So uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit in uh, you know describe to me a little bit uh, in detail uh, because we have a few minutes, um, you know what. What are the contents uh, of your of your volume? What kind of contributors do you have? Are they all coming from literature and aesthetics and philosophy? Um, you know, and what kinds of texts? If they're if if a lot of their readings are text based, as I assume they are, I don't know. Then um, you uh, you know, could you could you uh, just give us a hint of of what's there uh, in this volume? Thanks. Yeah, of course, of course. You know. Uh uh, as I said, you know, as you already said in your opening remarks, there are uh, all kinds of people here. But what I wanted to do, um, as you rightly said, because of my interest, maybe, and I have taken great help of the empirical uh, studies of uh, our friends from political science departments and also social departments of sociology and history. Uh, uh, they have done great work um, and have been doing great work. But, you know, I thought we can ask because of, as you rightly said, from my vantage point, uh, uh, 
what are the underlying principles of populism right from the beginning? What exactly is hatred? What exactly is uh, resentment? What exactly is jealousy? What, what are the things that, that, that binds her, which has a kind of, this is not to sub, make things subjective, you know, but to see how subjectivity and the objective side of it comes together. So therefore, you know, there are some trained philosophers, um, V. Sanil and Melin um, Wakankar from IIT Delhi, who has really gone back uh, in the South Asian context and also generally into these categories. And I've been, and Shah Mohan, you know, uh, uh, we, I, I got greatly benefited by their asking very fundamental, original questions about uh, these issues, you know, which I think has to be taken seriously. And then there are some literary uh, people uh, um, whom I know who, who has gone to the texts and try to bring these questions through certain literary means, you know, through um, fiction and nonfiction, to other things by which life and literature sort of comes together, uh, humanities and social science comes together. And then in one section is about what happens You've become muted. Ah, Sorry. These are the things. And also, there are political scientists. There's one section uh, reserved for uh, hardcore political theorists uh, and who have uh, right. done a great job. Yeah. I Thanks, Shanta. We have uh, uh, another question that's just suddenly come in, uh, and we still have you know a couple of minutes, so uh, I'll read it out to you. It says, "How do you look at the figure of the mob leader, vis-a-vis -vis this notion of honor?" It's it's from Keshav Bansal. Uh, how or to what extent is the personality or cult of personality instrumental in framing the mob's understanding? and it's imaginary of honor, right? So, so this, I, I think this question is trying to draw, you know, a connection between the personality of the leader, the cult of personality, uh, and, you know, our leaders always honorable, um, yeah. you know, yeah. No, this is a great question. You know, the idea of cult and leadership is a central tenet of, of understanding populism, you know, the, the uh, the, the external paraphernalia, uh, the rhetoric uh, of, of the leader and so on, uh, you know, there has been all kinds of great studies about that. But uh, one would say the idea of mob is an amorphous category, right? It itself is something which, which can move out and come in, you know, uh, it's kind of what Laclau calls, you know, empty signifier, you know, blank signifier. It goes. So therefore, the, 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 I, the leader it cannot be a vanguard or leader is may not always be visible all the time and that's the trick there's a kind of trump loyal there's a kind of you know hallucinatory possibility of the leader who is there and still not there's a very magical phenomena that we see and then therefore this kind of mob one can say what you know at the risk of overstating there's a very interesting masochism one feels with the relationship that the mob and the leader has in our times you know that we are sub So, um, yeah, you were you know, also more than one, there are tentacles and there's a you know, percolation of leadership styles rather. I would like to rather look at the styling of, of leadership rather than one of them, one leader and so on. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think you've, you know, you've hit the nail on the head when you say that, um, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this leadership can be invisible or can be behind the scenes. It can also be perhaps uh, spectacular and very much, uh, you know, present and in your face. And I think there's a good connection between the first question and the second question uh, from, from uh, audience members in that, you know, uh, positive and negative aspects, right, of populism and positive and negative connotations of the idea of honor and leadership, right? Um, I mean, uh, what, who is a, 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 a negative sort of a leader, leader figure? Is a despot, is a tyrant, is a dictator, right? Um, anyway, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, but, but you know, such, such a figure may also be a representative, especially in a democratic context of the will of the populace. Uh, so, so th there's a very weird contradiction there. Uh, I, we've actually run out of time, but since we have uh, a question or a comment from 
from one of the contributors to 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 my volume uh, 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 dr uh, parvez alam uh, i'll just uh, i'll just quickly uh, tell you what the question is um uh, or i'll just i'll just put it out there maybe we can continue in the next uh, in the next speaker's uh, you know uh, uh, presentation populist regimes uh, in our times have captured the Demo have captured democratic institutions and in fact liberal democracy has paved the way for their arrival this is parvez alam so uh, you know the the the, the populist regimes uh, try to provide final solutions to ongoing conflicts and uh, counter hegemonic forces have not been successful because uh, of the lack of he says a chain of equivalence um don't you see a potential in agonistic democracy uh where adversaries are in permanent cost contestation making the political alive right so there's no final solution in a sense that's what he's saying parvez alam is at aligarh muslim university there's also another question and i'll just read it out um <laughs> it's from uh, uh kabilan uh, cl it says uh, how do you look at people like bernie sanders uh who are regarded as le uh, left populist leaders in our times um and um there have been a range of of supporting arguments uh, uh, for the rise of left populism in the us uh and and how are we going to approach this so i i won't i won't expect you to answer the second question because i mean it has absolutely no connection to your paper um but if you just want to say a word on agonistic democracy and 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 unending conflict in a sense of uh, to pervase i'll let you do that and then we'll just close in in a minute yeah i'm i'm sure uh, dr alam and i'll have time to discuss this more but at the, on the face of it i couldn't agree more with him absolutely you know this is a ongoing process which is not going to end soon and it's an agonistic possibility and and, and your first point about that the liberal democrats have actually paved way for what we are seeing now from both left and the right is is spot on i think you know so i couldn't agree more with you we'll sure have more time to uh, have have more uh, in depth discussion on this point thank you shanta uh, we're going to take you off camera now and move on to our next speaker thank you very very much for your opening um, thank you paper um our next speaker is uh, dr hilal ahmed uh, my favorite colleague really here at the center uh for the study of developing societies he's a very very eminent um um scholar of politics of social movements of identities of history uh he has a wide range of interests uh which which go all the way from you know the cultural politics of 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 monuments and archives um you know to uh, really uh, detailed uh, studies of uh, the muslim community its history its its uh, you know uh, doctrinal ramifications its class uh, aspects uh, uh, caste all these different kinds of things in addition to his uh, strong interest in electoral democracy electoral processes uh and his uh fulsome contributions to our lok neeti program uh which uh, uh which often conducts uh very uh minute studies of um <clears throat> uh of 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 uh, uh uh elections uh and and of the relationship uh between uh representatives uh and their uh, and their voters uh in 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 the kind of evolving uh story of of indian democracy um <clears throat> professor ahmed is uh, an associate professor here and a fellow um he's also the associate editor of the journal south asian studies he's the author of uh, of of um of three books um on siyasi muslims the story of political islam in india uh, muslim political discourse in post colonial india um monuments memory and contestations um and and the reason that we are here today uh is he is looking at um he, he's going to be uh you know sort of he's both contributed to the volume that uh, that folker and i have edited uh but he's also written a book together with um uh, our uh, uh, colleagues uh, our senior colleague uh, uh, uh professor peter de souza and our colleague uh 
uh, Dr. Sanjeev Ralam, who couldn't join us today, unfortunately. Uh, and this book, which is which is the one that we're we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, today, uh, in particular, uh, is Democratic Accommodations: um, Minorities in Contemporary India. Um, this is uh, uh, this is this is the new book. Uh, that uh, Peter and Hilal and Sanjeev have co-authored. Um, and um, he's going to be speaking on um, the, the topic of his presentation today. And I, I should say that like a good citizen, he's gone and got his vaccine. So he's feeling a little bit under the weather. <laughs> um, so, uh, so be gentle. Um, <clears throat> he's going to be speaking on um, actually what is a minority? a uh, very important, very central question, post-colonial Indian meanings. So Hilal, uh, Hilal Bhai, I'll hand over to you. I hope you'll uh, be able to bear up for the next half an hour. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ananya, for these kind words. Uh, I must uh, say that uh, the book which you refer to, uh, Democratic Accommodations, uh, is something which is uh, a product of CSDs, uh, our conversation with each other. And uh, I must say that uh, Professor Peter D'Souza, uh, my teacher and my former colleague, was instrumental in forcing us to think clearly about the question of minority. And I'm also thankful you, Ananya, uh, because you also encouraged me a lot to contribute to your volume. So actually, I was able to uh, make some kind of a comparative study of Constitutionalism. Uh, I'll come to this uh, point later, but I'm also grateful to the conceptualization of uh, this Ram Table Ananya. It's a very well thought of idea, and you designed it quite, uh, you know, creatively. Uh, and that's why uh, my task is much more easier because for so for me. And I'm also grateful to Parvez who asked a very powerful and very uh, you know, very crucial question, which I think uh, is central to my presentation today as well. Uh, what I'm going to do, like a good political scientist, uh, I'll share my PowerPoint. Uh, I don't believe that power corrupts and power corrupts, uh, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. But uh, just to, uh, because I am going to share with you uh, a kind of technical boring details and how these boring details contribute to our understanding of minority politics. So I'm going to share now uh, my screen. And because uh, the idea uh, of the round table is to have provocation rather a set of questions which we have uh, dealt in my, in our book as well as the kind of work which I did after finishing the book. Uh, and uh, Professor Peter D'Souza would certainly have more to say when it comes to his presentation because he is going to make a presentation on democratic accommodation. Uh, so my part is divided uh, without talking to him. Uh, my, uh, we, have we have divided uh, our contributions. So I am entirely focusing on post-colonial Indian meaning of the term minority. Uh, in your presentation, uh, initially, Aranya, you referred to Muslims. And this is my starting point that we need to actually get rid of uh, this Muslim equivalent to minority and Hindu equivalent to uh, majority syndrome in order to problematize the idea of minority itself that is in post-colonial India. Uh, I have actually three questions to, uh, to uh, why do we need to talk of contemporary meanings of the term minority? Is this still an unsettled question? Is minority a problem? This is the problem which British often invoked uh, when we had our... The second question is about, as I said that I am a trained political scientist, it's coming out from me, are constitutional meanings of the term minority fixed? If yes, in what sense? And if no, why they are not fixed? And the final meaning of the final question which I'm going to deal in this presentation is, what are the meanings of the term called minority politics? 
is it only linked to the group that are recognized as minority officially and because uh, we have now now a new dominant player in indian politics hindutva what is hindutva's imagination of a minority so these are the three questions which i would like to uh, i'm not going to answer this question rather i have collected a set of documents in order to problematize these and in the final instead of a conclusion i would raise another question uh, relating to these three uh two clarifications are important that i am primarily concerned with the idea of contemporary uh, and therefore my story is in time post colonial and second is that my presentation is entirely an interpretative exercise it is simply a reading of a few document and i am not saying that my reading of the document is ultimate so feel free to look at the document from your own vantage point to draw your own meanings uh so let me begin with an interesting intellectual debate with regard to the idea of minority first is the colonial perception and principles how do colonial state look at the question of minority in colonial india and there are three usually three arguments that are often made uh, these arguments uh, concretized in the 1940s but it continued to if you, if you look at uh, uh, debates Uh, colonial debates that from 1880 onwards you find that these arguments somewhere or the other uh, constitute the uh, the political discourse in a significant way so the first perception the colonial perception was that minority and majorities are fixed entity as uh, they could only be recognized as either as nationalities or second majority and in this fixation uh, non muslims non hindus would be minority and muslim would be the second minor, second majority or the nationality later on and hindus would be a permanent fixed majority so we have got hindu muslim divide as minority majority divide in colonial india the second perception or the principle that was invoked was that european style nation state is the only form of institutional apparatus that can solve minority problems of problem of the subcontinent meaning that uh, because you have permanent minority and majority and you do not, you you are unable to fit in the european style nation state framework therefore uh, you cannot reclaim uh, yourself as a nation and finally diversity is always seen as a political weakness it for religious marginalization is, is natural phenomenon and the partition like politics uh, was inevitable was seen as inevitable and partition was actually justified uh, on the basis of diversity the, the the problem of diversity now constant assembly and when i say constant assembly i am uh, talking specifically the moment Uh, after the creation of pakistan if you closely look at uh, the debates you may find three kind of arguments actually responding to the colonial perception the first argument was diversity is a positive virtue primarily because it contributes to the unity and integrity of the country hence the institution the future institution should be created for dealing with diversity and unity must be recognized as a principle the second argument which evolved in constant assembly was that there are various kind of differences that make india a diverse country hence there is a need to classify these forms of diversity and evolve an institutional setup to manage them and finally sociological diversity of india it is argued symbolizes the live together attitude of indian communities this tendency it is said is very crucial for nation building and state formation hence in must facilitate this process so as a result what we find three technical stories of the term minority the first story was 1949-50 moment uh, the final draft of indian constitution as we all know rejected reservation for minority in jobs and political institutions and uh, the constitution which we have at the moment Uh, which was implemented in 1950 uses the term minority as an impermanent category at least in two ways meaning that distinct first meaning of minority constitutionally speaking was distinctiveness any section of citizen having a distinct language script of culture uh, 
can be uh, designated as minority and this is article 29 and 30 of the indian constitution and at the same time uh, religion is not the only criterion uh, on the basis of which a minority can be identified. Therefore, the multiple meaning of minority were also accepted. And that's why linguistic, the idea of linguistic minorities was also taken very seriously. So we have got article 25, 26 and 350 in this regard. But what is interesting is that these constitutional meaning uh, somehow uh, were not sufficient and it was argued that the protection of minorities, meaning the minority in terms of religion and minority in terms of uh, linguistic, linguistic groups should be taken care of. And as a result, we have got various commissions and new set of institutions created. Since in 1978, Minorities Commission was constituted. In 1992, National Commission for Minorities Act passed uh, following this act, the National Commission for Minority uh, created as a statutory body. And what the most interesting uh, aspect, uh, the outcome of this act was that Government of India notified five religious communities, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Buddhist, Parsis, as minority communities. This process continued, and in 2006, Ministry of Minority Affairs was also established. And finally, in 2014, Jains were also notified as religious minority at the national level. What is interesting in this case, in post, in since 1992, uh, first of all, religious minorities at the national level were defined for the first time in entirely religious terms. So there, so the distinction between the overlapping between uh, linguistic minority and religious minorities uh, were abolished. And finally, uh, following the National Commission for Minorities Act, only the religious communities at the national level were identified as minorities in the official sense. So I make, I'm just flagging this point. I'll come to this point later. Now, in, since post-1993, we have got Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Buddhist, and Parsis, and now Jain, as national minorities. Now, I'm emphasizing this term permanent fixed national minorities. So if we have got national minorities, who would be the... Uh, but these, these new institutional developments actually uh, raises a number of questions and Supreme Court of, Court of India uh, came out with the very interesting formulations in different cases. For instance, uh, in famous uh, TMI Pi Foundation case in 2002, a special location of a group, whether, uh, whether linguistic of, or religious, is identified as the criteria by which you can identify a minority. Meaning, uh, on the one hand, National Commission for Minorities Act identified national minorities while uh, Supreme Court said that uh, in order to recognize a minority, you must take state population seriously and at the, at, as the basic criterion to identify a minority. Second and second important thing was backwardness. Mishra Commission report argues that all those classes, section or group among the minority should be treated as backward whose counterparts in the majority committee are regarded as backward. So that was first is special location, second is backwardness. And finally, the third thing, which also uh, such a commission and Mishra Commission identified was uh, they strongly argue that the category called scheduled caste should not be confined to uh, Sikh, Buddhist, and Hindus. It should be secularized so that Dalit Muslim and Dalit Christian should also be constitutionally recognized as uh, scheduled caste. We have to remember that scheduled caste, cat uh, unlike scheduled tribe and OBC, scheduled caste category does not include Dalit Muslims and Dalit Christians. Uh, now, if this is the case, so we have got five different post-colonial meaning of minority. First is distinctiveness. As I said, that any section of citizen having a distinct would be identified 
as minority then there is a multiplicity of minority then there is the third point is special location state would be a reference point to identify a minor minority second backwardness of a group can also be attributed to the meaning of minority and finally minority within within minority must be identified therefore inclusion of dalit muslim and dalit christian in sc list is inevitable now what is the hindutva meaning and this is the because i wanted to provoke a few questions which are coming out of it this is somehow a settled political consensus but what is interesting about contemporary hindutva they have somehow destabilized these settled meaning of the term minority in a various ways let me just start with three three statement made by uh, three uh, minister including prime minister narendra modi Uh, in post 2014 period uh, tc gehlot who was uh, minister of social justice said that there is no place for religion based reservation for minorities and he said that the purpose of reservation in india was to reform hinduism narendra modi uh, i think probably that the only time he refers to muslim by name he said that and he was evoking uh, the indian upadhyay in one of the meeting in 2016 a public meeting he said do not punish them do not reward them but purify them hence it is sabka saath sabka vikas najma hatullah for the shorter period of time when she was the ministry of minority affairs minister she said muslims are a majority they should come forward and do rely on government support so the argument is that you have to uh, so there was a very interesting move to problematize the idea of minority uh, now mohan bhagwat uh, in uh, in his three famous lectures which he delivered in october 2018 uh, in uh, in the third day of that conclave he made a very interesting argument he said that we do not need minority majority distinction because it was invented by the british in a way he is right as i just pointed out that british actually divide uh, indian communities into minority and majority but what is interesting in this uh, in this uh, assertion of bhagwat is that uh, he is somehow making this argument in order to legitimize what i call hindutva victimhood in what ways let us just have a look at this uh this is a long story this story doesn't start in 2018 uh this is a letter which was written by a group of people who were associated with rss in andhra pradesh and it this letter was sent to uh the governor and the president during the time when the parliament were discussing communal violence bill and they argue that this bill is ill conceived because it has taken into consideration the majority and minority situation in india it has totally forgotten that religion is a globalized issue now and that there are global strategies to reward smaller religion the fund flow from outside india seems to have been totally lost sight of the framer of this bill Samuel Huntington studies have to be kept in mind on this issue. I don't think that they have read Huntington in details, but this is something which uh, is very interesting. So the idea which is coming out here that we do not believe in majority minority distinction somehow has a history. Hindus are a global minority. and muslims so therefore this distinction between muslim uh, this distinction shouldn't be reduced to uh, to india now hindu as a minority in south asia so c c a a is a very interesting example uh what is you know what i'm going to do to show you two contrasts one is uh, when this joint parliamentary committee was constituted in 2009 government of india gave these two answer to the committee when it comes to the question of why muslim coming from these three muslim state are not included in the list of refugees those who are going to get citizenship on the uh, you know there some ease of getting indian citizenship to six communities and this the and the government answer was that indian state is empowered to invoke legal reasonableness 
to make laws for a set of people. And they also said that refugees coming from other countries, including Muslim from these three countries, may apply through the standard SPO system. But what is interesting is Amit Shah's quote. Uh, and he said, all the Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist Christian, they will get citizenship. We want to walk up to them and give them citizenship. They wouldn't be asked for any documents. And this is certainly not the case because uh, there is no SPO for those who are coming from uh, those minority religion uh, people who are coming from these three countries. So the point is that CAA conceptualized Hindus as minority in the larger South Asian framework and in the larger global framework as well. So if we just look at uh, this table, I'm not going to explain this table because I have already pointed out these five things, five, uh, uh, five specific feature of the idea of minority. Sorry, sorry in to you. Yeah, I'm just going to finish on it. Yeah, you're almost yeah. done. Huh? Yeah, you yeah. run out of time. Yeah. yeah. So instead of a conclusion, I ask a question. Uh, the move to declare five religious communities as national minorities strengthened the already worked out imagination of Hindu majority. It had now become easier for the Hindu centuries to argue that the minority, especially Muslims, are appeased and pampered at national level. Does the act of defining religious minority, and this is the question which I would like to pose, does the act of defining religious minority at the national level in post-1992 period symbolize a departure from the established constitutional principle, which does not offer any fixed interpretation of the term minority. So thank you very much. Uh, I stop here and I'm sorry I have uh, taken a lot of time. Yeah, thank you. Ananya, you, uh, I can't hear you. Really on you. No, I was just saying that's 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 fine. You were well well within your time. Uh, I just uh, just to get us started on 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 our discussion. Um, I just uh, I mean, you know, you really you said you're going to go into the gory details, and you really did, uh, in the sense of laying out the history from the time of partition, the making of the constitution, um, the way things changed around the demolition of the Babri Masjid. And then uh, the way things have, the status quo has been massively disturbed again with the introduction of the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, of, of 2019, right? Which is why we are back to the table uh, and really, in a sense, returning to the foundational questions uh, which were uh, on everyone's minds at the time of decolonization and partition. Um, so, uh, I, I thought it was absolutely crucial what you said, that the term minority was left undefined. Now, I would like you to explore perhaps a little bit more uh, the political imagination that would be involved in leaving such a key term undefined, right? I mean, in a sense, five communities have been named right they've been named and yet you are saying that it's undefined there is an implicit definition which is based on numerical numbers or numerical strength right that whatever is more is the majority whatever is less is the minority and yet you are saying there's a lack of definition and you are also saying uh, i think in one of your earlier slides you said there's an impermanent category right that means that there is some vision that numbers can fluctuate People can leave, people can enter, populations can grow, populations can decline, people can convert, people can change their identity, people can refuse their, uh, you know, uh, ascribed identities and uh, adopt new ones. So what, what all is um, allowed through this idea of impermanence and indeterminacy and lack of definition? And how are those options now being systematically shut down or are they uh, in this new phase of majoritarianism of the Hindu variety that we are seeing in the last seven years? Yeah, thank you, Ananya. Uh, let me just clarify what I mean by impermanent. Uh, constitution, as I said, does not 
define the term minority. And the purpose of uh, not defining minority was primarily because the uh, and you know minority SCST and later OBC these were the templates, administrative templates, uh, which were created later means in post after the implementation of the constitution to maintain the point that sociological categories, you know sociological categories should not be the criteria to determine a status of a group. So therefore, it, these were the open categories. So people would come in the category, say SC, they would take benefit of reservation for some time. And then there would be an evaluation. And finally, there would be exit policy. And somehow that imagination was also central to the idea of minority. And that's why in various cases, I think if you go back to 1971, uh, there was a famous DAV case where this was asserted that the idea of state, the population at the state level should be the criteria to determine a minority. So there was no scope to think of a national minority and that too in a religious term. But the, 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 the demand for affirmative action for religious, especially religious communities in post 78 period somehow created new institutions like uh, first minorities commission then national commission for minorities and there was a very, very significant difference between these two institutions so when these two these two or three institutions were created then new questions emerged are, and this these are unresolved questions still we have at least four or five uh, cases going on in the supreme court of india to define what is the meaning of minority now, this is the gray area. And my point was that this gray area is always used to articulate new political formulation. So what are, uh, Mohan Bhagwat says that minority majority distinction was invented by the British. In, in a way, he's right. But at the same time, what kind of uh, politics he is actually um, working out? So in this politics, uh, Hindu victimhood is somehow, you know, I, I'll... Uh, I don't have that thing at the moment right now, but there is a very interesting book came out in 19, uh, in, in 2019, 2018, it's called Hindu Human Rights Report. And it was edited by our former colleague, Madhu Kishwar. And it is argued that number uh, do not matter. What is important is powerlessness. And she compares um, the status of Hindus in this country with South African blacks, saying that, that they were in large in number, but at the same time, they are victimized. So this, the, the gray area which I'm, I'm trying to underline is somewhere the politics is always articulated. Um, I should just say for the benefit of everyone that I'm, I'm going to let, I have a couple more questions which are uh, somebody has uh, asked you. So I'm going to give you time to continue that. And then we'll just go a little over into the lunch hour uh, for our next presentation because this is too important to just uh, drop um, because of a lack of time. Uh, I think what you, the point you're making is very important that uh, if I may put it in my words, which is that uh, we have to think uh, not just of religious identity, but also of caste in, in the Indian context. And social mobility and social change and social justice and, uh, you know, uh, the morphing of identities, uh, all of that uh, is enabled through mechanisms like reservations and affirmative action, right? Which have a evolving kind of a... a you know, horizon that, that wheel is, you know, continuously turning and it's rolling forward. So of course, groups of people are cycling through that system as they get benefits. The idea is that they should rise out of it into some kind of an undifferentiated mass, uh, right? They should stop needing uh, the help of the state to compensate for their uh, initial handicaps. Uh, but that intersects in a very interesting way with communal politics. Uh, which which has a kind of different trajectory from from partition onwards, uh, especially in the in the conception of the non secular 
uh, uh, political forces, which are these days dominant uh, in 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 our in our in our uh, country. So I think that's that's a very very important point you made. Um, uh, and I, uh, you know, of course, we we'll, we have to look at your work uh, in its broader totality for us to 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 continue this discussion. I also think that the 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 idea that you brought up about the minority of Hindus. in a world perspective where there may be more muslims or more christians or you know more communists or whatever it is um uh is something that you know uh, and 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 of course the, the the you know the the idea of resentment and 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 the idea of um you know uh uh victimhood that goes along with that sense of uh, a majority claiming that it is a minority um that is something which i think is very nicely theorized uh, by arjun apadurai in his in his very crucial little book which i always return to the fear of small numbers that how is it that majorities end up fearing minorities and 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 painting themselves as the victims uh, this is a structural issue and it's across the board uh, in in a lot of these discussions so thank you i have uh, keshav bansal he's asked two questions and i'll just quickly read them out one is his one he's saying is what are your views on the intersectional existence of minorities within the larger idea of a unified hindu majority so he gives the example of lingayats mm. Mm. i would even add probably buddhists and jains and sikhs to this because uh, you know from a hindu right perspective you know this is all somehow broadly and vaguely uh, some kind of a uh, broad <clears throat> hindu umbrella but that may not um that may not gel with either the case law uh, or the constitutional definitions right um mm-hmm. so so he you know he's he's given the example of lingayats but you know you may want to address this widely and his second question is which is a follow up is um uh are such minority identities like lingayats i think he means completely absent from political conceptualization of the hindu majority that is to say are minorities hiding within a majority and you know how are they supposed to uh, think of their rights and their status and then i'm sorry through suddenly now people have woken up uh, which is what i was hoping would not happen um, but um um kaliban uh, sorry kabilan <laughs> has another question which is um uh, he's saying thanks for this wonderful session my question is about the categorization of the hindu populace by the british through their first census enumeration right so he's he's saying you know look look at the impact of labeling right a varied set of non muslim and non christian communities as hindu whereas they may have been i mean we all know the story from from you know bernard cohen and so on that they may have been other forms of identity which are kind of elided under this category of hindu which is created for the first time uh, through census operations in the colonial period so does the political imagination of the current ruling regimes in terms of articulating minorities stem from this phenomenon this original colonial labeling phenomenon and enumeration phenomenon um, so in a way is, isn't that also a legacy of the british right i think these are both good questions i yeah. give you like maybe three four minutes if you can just quickly sure. wrap them up thank you yeah thank you very much uh, ananya for uh, your question and all all these three questions uh first of all the purpose of this round table what i understand is to provoke more questions so i am not here to say that what i am what so ever i'm going to say is the final answer we also have to we have to collectively think on these questions so it's a collective exercise so uh, what i think on this question this is something which i am going to share with you uh <clears throat> first is about the minority majority question and your reference to uh lingayat question like yeah. <clears throat> uh i think that uh, coming back to uh, what you said ananya i think it is important that we uh, must be must recognize that constitution i am not a worshipper of constitution i always take constitution as a document which is pos- which is a critical document and which is Uh, a subject to multiple critical interpretation 
what i realize uh, in post 1992 period that somehow except bjp others have stopped taking constitution critically and as a result some kind of a politically correct explanation we we we, we, we are in a uh in some kind of we were in a politically correct you know um, we were in a phase where it was politically correct to think constitution as the ultimate source of everything bjp has destabilized it in a very interesting way and this is what i called hindutva constitutionalism so when we say constitutionalism there is a technical meaning of it but at the same time there is a political meaning to it as well so bjp's use of constitution or constitutionalism is something which is very interesting and significant so <clears throat> my response to the uh, how do they conceptualize the idea of uh, grand majority i think hindutva constitutionalism is not at all interested in defining uh, what is a majority they are primarily concerned with the idea of minority not majority <clears throat> why and i give you a few examples one example is that first of all what is a constitution constitution is simply a rule book so principles are detached from the rule book so you have to take constitution as a separate entity second is minority uh, we are a country of minorities and therefore uh what is needed is to protect the interest of every segment there is a court case in supreme court uh which says that hindus must be recognized in those areas where their population is less from other religious group and they are invoking the concept of minority again so the emphasis is not on the question of majority to define oneness of hinduism rather the emphasis on their victimhood so we have to be very clear when we understand bjp's politics at the moment they are not concerned to define who who is a hindu bhagwat time and again would say muslims are also hindu sikhs are also hindu etc but what is the victimhood meant what what, what constitute their victimhood so therefore we have to make this distinction between majority and minority they are primarily concerned with the powerlessness of a minority and therefore hindu can also be legitimately called minority in that sense third is one nation one constitution you have to, and this is the argument which they make when they revoked article 370 we need one constitution and this constitution is based on uh, on the question of equality the idea of minority somehow destabilize the idea of equality therefore we should have one nation one constitution framework to deal with all issues so therefore the answer i am <clears throat> going to offer is that we have to understand the ways in which the idea of minorities is appropriated the final comment is about the legacy of british i am i don't think that we should you know reduce everything to the british uh, my purpose in this presentation was to look at the ways in which you know our constitution got the framer of our constitution constitution were so intelligent they intentionally get rid of the idea of hindu and muslim as categories so they created empty ideas of minority and majority not majority minority so therefore there was a possibility to secularize the idea of minority but the competitive electoral politics somehow contributed differently and they made the idea of minority a permanent category again in post 1992 period so therefore to say that everything is linked to british legacy is absolutely wrong this is an outcome of our electoral politics so i think i should stop here i think you're i think you're right i mean uh, i've personally always thought of course of uh, you know um, colonial operations of enumeration and classification as quite crucial to the creation of post colonial identities but you are right that it's about time that we start taking post colonial uh, legal and and juridical and and uh, you know electoral uh, and political uh, factors into Uh, giving them due weight you know into we take them into consideration and really see how they have fundamentally altered many things i mean if you look at pre partition you know a british empire in india you know 
it it's a vast area that extends from you know west asia down to you know burma and uh, it's not clear at all that muslims are any kind of minority in this right um so 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 that is a inflection point that's really important but then as you are saying there are there continue to be such inflection points uh, especially because of competitive democracy which is uh, um in many cases identity based and identity driven along the lines of religion and caste or perhaps caste more prominently but somehow that also affects uh, the way in which uh, religious identities are conceptualized so thank you very much halal that was absolutely excellent but i'm afraid we are we are quite now uh, you know cumulatively lagging behind in our schedule so i'll have to move on thank you i'll let you go and i'll invite our next speaker thank you um so our next speaker is um um professor ishwaran uh, sridharan um i have uh, known professor sridharan for a very very long time um he is uh, you know uh, the academic director and the chief executive of uh, the institute for the advanced study of india that is um, uh, uh, that runs out of the university of pennsylvania uh and he he looks after it here in new delhi uh, he's been uh, doing this for a number of years um and he's a he's a keen and uh, frequent participant in in uh, a lot of our uh, events here at the center um uh, and and uh, you know he's very familiar with a lot of our work especially of our lokniti colleagues um he has contributed to our volume uh, folkar and my volume uh, along with Uh, uh, a frequent uh, collaborator and uh, co-writer of his, uh, Dr. Adnan Farooqi, who is at Jamia Millia University in in the Political Science Department. Adnan couldn't join us today, unfortunately. Um, uh, although again, he's a very active uh, interlocutor for us here at the center, uh, but he's uh, supervising exams at his own university, so he's not able to to uh, to necessarily commit the time. Um, so. Um, Professor Shridharan um, uh, is going to speak. Uh, you know, he's he's actually going to share with us some of what he's uh, contributed to to our volume, um, uh, and this is a work that he and Adnan have done on on the Rajya Sabha um, uh, as a corrective mechanism for uh, Muslim underrepresentation. The Rajya Sabha. i mean for for those who are joining from overseas is of course the upper house uh, of the indian parliament um and um uh, people uh, are nominated to this uh, upper house uh, not they don't necessarily have to be elected uh, and and so therefore i assume that you know it it it, it can potentially correct for uh, numerical inconsistencies and underrepresentation uh, that afflict minorities uh, in an electoral parliamentary democratic system um so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, sridharan and i'm sorry to uh, to delay us and make you wait a little bit uh, but we can we can we can have your full half hour and just take a short lunch break uh, please thank you ananya i might not need that much time and as ananya just said i'm presenting jointly for adnan and myself adnan faruqi of jamia millia islamia and myself it was a joint chapter done uh, for the uh, uh, volume which ananya and uh, folkar all have edited and so thank you for inviting us to this project uh, this paper i mean this chapter looks at whether the rajya sabha can be or has been and can be a corrective mechanism for the under representation of muslims in the lok sabha now uh, given our first past the post uh, electoral system which is a british derived anglo saxon uh, derived system uh, essentially it's a single member district simple plurality that is uh, you have one candidate per this electoral district in american parlance one candidate per electoral constituency and to get elected you need a simple plurality that is More votes than anybody else, but it doesn't have to be fifty percent plus. It doesn't have to be a simple majority. You can have, you, you can get a, in some of the recent elections, the last twenty years, there have been instances of people, the winning candidate in some UP constituencies, but just between twenty-five and thirty percent vote and been elected because the 
system of the vote has been fragmented with no candidate getting even that much, getting, getting even less than 25%. So you can win with the plurality. Now, what has been the actual uh, outcome in terms of representation of Muslims in the Lok Sabha? Now, we have shown that, I mean, we haven't included this chapter was submitted before the 2019 election. So we've got everything from the first elections in 1952 to the uh, 2014 elections. And the result is that a Muslim population since from independent 1951 census to the 2011 census went up from about 11% to 14%, uh, from 9.9% .9 to 14%, including Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, on average, the Muslim population has been 12%. Uh, over this whole period, and uh, on average, I don't want to, we've got a lot of tables, no time to go into all the tables, so I'm just summing up. Uh, on average, the Muslim representation in the Lok Sabha is about 6%. The highest it ever reached was 1980, when it reached about 9%, which was very close to the 11% population at that time. In 1984 was also a good year, a good election year. In terms of representation, it reached uh, fairly close closer than it uh, above the 6% average to something like uh, almost 8-9% eight, eight, compared to 11% at that time for the Muslim population. Since 2014, it has come down practically to about 4% in 2014 and 19 compared to a 14% Muslim population. So why is there an underrepresentation in the Lok Sabha? In the SMSP system, what we call the first past the post system, uh, the, there are two crucial factors. One is whether you are concentrated at the constituency level, you have whether a minority is concentrated so as to be a majority in a number of constituents, like a lot of scheduled tribes, so they're nationally a majority, are concentrated geographically in certain areas where in those seats, even though they are reserved for them, they may not even need reservation because they're concentrated their majority in those seats, in those uh, constituencies. Now, only about, there are only about 13 Muslim majority constituencies out of 543 elected constituencies in the Lok Sabha. And the rest of the Muslim, and those 13 have only less than 10% of the Muslim population. 90% of the Muslim population is distributed as what we have defined as a dispersed minority. That is, a minority which does not enjoy a majority at the constituency level. And we've given the uh, dispersion of uh, Muslims at the constituency level in our tables. I, I won't go into that now, but just to say, a vast majority of uh, Muslims in India are distributed as a dispersed minority, not having a majority at the constituency level, except these 13 constituencies, three in the Kashmir Valley, one in Lakshadweep Islands, uh, uh, one in Assam, uh, one in UP, three in Bengal, or uh, something like that. Uh, and there are some Muslim majority constituency like Bijnor in UP or Karim Ganj in Bengal, which are reserved for Tadil class. They don't get to uh, be candidates, right? let alone get elected. Now, the second factor which determines the representation of a minority, a dispersed minority, is whether the cleavage between that minority and the majority is salient. Literature talks about salient cleavages. Now, Cleavages don't always have to be salient. Saliency of cleavages depends on relationships between groups which varies across time and space. If you look at uh, pre-World War II Europe, Jews were a minority uh, and a salient cleavage. They were considered the other in a large part of continental Europe, especially Central and Eastern Europe. Now, uh, if you look at post-1945 to the present, post-war, Europe and North America, US, Canada, and Britain, uh, Jews are a minority, a religious minority, okay? And you can call it also an ethnic minority, although they're not a visible ethnic minority. But they're overrepresented in the parliaments, in the House of Representatives, in the uh, US and in the Senate, and in Canada, Britain, and France, where there are significant Jewish communities that traditionally been overrepresented, which means the saliency of the cleavage is not significant. They're not seen as others or outsiders. Okay, uh, It's in a sense what uh, sociologist T.K. Woman once called the, uh, insider minorities and outsider minorities. He said that some minorities are considered integral part of the society, insiders. Some minorities are considered outsiders. Okay? So the saliency of the cleavage, so these two things 
uh, matter in a first past the post system about representation of minority bodies, uh, dispersion, whether they are local majorities or not, and second, saliency of the cleavage, which changes over time and which can change for political reasons. In, it can be uh, whipped up. I mean, sentiments can be whipped up, what you're seeing in the last I mean, several years, last three decades actually, against Muslims, uh, those can be manufactured. Or, and that can also uh, acquire a grip on the minds of a large section of the population. Okay. So can the Rajya Sabha be a corrective mechanism? And we show that the representation of Muslims in the Rajya Sabha has consistently been higher than in the Lok Sabha. Lok Sabha average 6% for an average 12% population of 1952 first election to 2014. In the Rajya Sabha, which is a permanent house, which doesn't get dissolved, you know, uh, one third of the Rajya Sabha membership, Rajya Sabha members have six year terms, one third of them retire every two years. So every two years you have something like one third be re-elected. So the composition keeps changing every couple of years, but it's a permanent house. But in the from 1952 to the present, you have an average representation of Muslims in the Rajya Sabha of about uh, something like uh, 9%, which is just short of the uh, or 9 10%. Something like that over time, uh, which is much higher, much closer to the average 12% population over this period, currently 14%. So, how is this being achieved, and, what, and uh, can this be a corrective mechanism to represent in parliament? I mean, uh, uh, we show that the Rajya Sabha, since it gets elected, the electoral college for the Rajya Sabha is the assemblies of the states. So, uh, the electors are the MLAs. Okay, and the election uh, electoral system is not first past the post. It is single transferable vote, SPB system, which operates on a quota basis. That is, who need a certain quota of votes to get each member elected. So, assuming that part, this means that parties have control over their MLAs, they tell them how to vote. I mean, people can cross vote. They have been cross voting in, uh, in some, because of secret ballot, they have been cross voting. but. By and large, if you assume that the legislators are bound by the party directives, then if you know, you know, everybody knows how many MLAs they have in that state legislature, they know how many times they can get the quota, that means how many Rajya Sabha MPs they can elect. So, what has been happening when the Congress was traditionally in power, right, from the 1950 to, to uh, I mean, uh, to 1989, the beginning of the Congress time, after you after which 1989 to the present, over 32 years, you've seen three mega trends. One is decline of the Congress vote share, rise of the BJP vote share, and consolidation of the non-Congress, non-BJP. That is third party's vote share, which has been 44 to 54% of the Lok Sabha, of the vote share in Lok Sabha elections. Okay. So uh, the ability of the, the, what the Congress used traditionally to do, the mechanism was, since in Lok Sabha elections, Muslims were seen as part of the support base of the Congress coalition, social coalition, especially in the major states where Muslims or Muslim population was concentrated, which was UP, Bihar, now also including Jharkhand, Bengal, Assam, where the bulk of the Indian Muslim population is in these states. There are also significant uh, numbers in Kerala, I mean 26% or so, in Gujarat and Maharashtra, about 10-12%, 11%, in Andhra Pradesh, about 11%. Karnataka about 11% or so, much less in Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, and of course, uh, majority in JNK. But by and large, what the Congress would do was that since Muslims were un getting underrepresented in the Lok Sabha for two reasons I've specified dispersion and saliency of the cleavage, uh, they would compensate them by getting them elected as uh, MPs in the Rajya Sabha uh, from, uh, because they would control the MLAs in state assemblies. Now, this mechanism of compensating Muslims in the Rajya Sabha by making them MPs there, uh, in, uh, due to the uh, uh, underrepresentation in the Lok Sabha, could be practiced as long as the Congress controlled the state assembly. Now, what has been happening uh, even before 1989, from 67 to 89, though, at the national level, you had the plurality based majorities. The vote plurality based seat majorities of the Congress, except for the Janata Interregnum, 1977 to 79, 
uh, and you had the erosion of Congress hegemony in the state assemblies by the rise of a whole range of regional parties from 67 onwards. And then that process continued from 89 to 2014, you know, 25 years of minority governments, uh, minor, including minority coalitions from uh, 89 to 2014. So Congress became less able to use the Rajya Sabha as a corrective mechanism to compensate Muslims uh, who were a part of this, what is about this, uh, uh, by representing using the STB uh, voting system, uh, where they could direct the MLAs to elect people, including people from other states and things like that. You don't have to be a resident of the state. Uh, this mechanism became eroded by the regional party consolidation in range of states. And with the BJP consolidation in a whole range of states, where BJP now controls uh, something like uh, half or more than half the states, if you count uh, BJP being a uh, coalition partner states like in Bihar or in uh, many other smaller states. Uh, so this mechanism became eroded. In Congress also had less incentive to do that because the Muslim vote also migrated to regional parties like Samajwadi Party, Bhajan Samaj Party, or like the RJD in UP or RJD in Bihar. Or like Trinamool Congress, West Bengal, and so on. So, the A, the Muslim vote also migrated to regional state level parties, and B, the Congress didn't control enough state assemblies to uh, utilize the Rajya Sabha as a compensation mechanism, where it had earlier, till at least 89, and in fact, uh, through the, some of the 90s too. Uh, I don't want to go into the uh, numbers, but basically, this was what happened the mechanism. Uh, we have all the tables, Adnan and I have all the tables here. Now, the question arises as whether, uh, you know, it is possible. Now, uh, even in the Rajya Sabha now, Muslim representation has fallen drastically since 2014, as the BJP has become more and more powerful, in, and BJP has, uh, in their behavior, I mean, whatever they may say, their behavior has been not to give tickets for Lok Sabha elections to, uh, and for state assembly elections to Muslims, this is from the nominations of candidates. Similarly, they do not uh, nominate and get can uh, Muslim candidates elected to Rajya Sabha MP chips from the states they control. So there is clearly operationally a policy of denial of tickets and of denial of representation, the operation, uh, which is visible, which is trackable statistically. Uh, so what does this imply now for Muslim representation in the present day India? How do they get represented? Uh, I don't, the Rajya Sabha mechanism uh, is possible so long as you have a party or a coalition uh, at nationally, uh, which has control of a large number of states. Now, right now we have about 12 states which are ruled by non-BJP parties, including the Congress. Congress plus the non-BJP parties control 12 states. Uh, out of them, some of the non-BJP, non-Congress parties uh, have made deals, various kinds of deals with BJP, for example, to pass legislation in the Rajya Sabha, like BJD in Orissa, like uh, PRS in Telangana, like uh, uh, YSR uh, Congress Party in Andhra and so on. And uh, so it's not a unified opposition at all. Uh, so this, our conclusion tends to be rather pessimistic in the sense that while this system of using the Rajya Sabha as a corrective mechanism for underrepresentation of Muslims in the Lok Sabha, has, this has already eroded since uh, even before 2014 with the rise, with the decline of Congress, rise of regional parties in the And this, same was, this uh, seems to have reached the end of the road as of now, unless you have the reversal. Uh, at the state level of the BJP's uh, horizontal expansion across India at the state level, uh, since BJP seems to have a clear policy of not of ticket denial. Uh, unless there is a sort of revival of either Congress or regional parties, uh, this mechanism seems to have reached its end with the Lok Sabha representation of Muslims at 4% against 14% population. And Rajya Sabha also come drastically down to about 5% now. The chapter doesn't have the 2019 results that were submitted before that, but it's about something like uh, four or five percent now. Uh, after the late, every two years, the composition of Rajya Sabha keeps changing. So we are at a fairly uh, pessimistic point 
in terms of uh, Muslim representation in the uh, institutions of power, of in the national legislature, the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. And I don't see this changing unless at the state level you have a large number of states uh, being captured by either Congress or third front parties. So I'll stop there. I'll take questions. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Sridharan. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, so based on facts and figures and, and quite statistical and technical in one sense, perhaps uh, it would have been helpful for, uh, you know, folks who don't have your chapter in front of them, uh, if you had shown us some of the, uh, you know, tabulated data, that might have been uh, a little bit uh, easier to then absorb uh, the point you were trying to make um, but I, uh, I let me let me kind of zoom out from the detail and um, and, and and try and uh, ask you a broader question um, and I think that would also help connect us with the uh, with our overall themes of populism and minorities even if we set aside the question of populism for the purposes of this paper. Um, you know, I think, I think this question of separate electorates, how to make um, voting uh, count for smaller constituencies, how to make representation, political representation in a democratic framework more meaningful when you have such a diversity of uh, of, of voters uh, by community, by caste, and so on. I think this, this, all of these issues were already on the table from the early 20th century, right? When you have the, the proposed first partition of Bengal, and there's a question of uh, separately uh, counting uh, Hindus and Muslims around 1905, even, right? Um, and then it comes up again, uh, of course, uh, during partition, which is, you know, 40, 50 years later. Um, but along the way, a very important inflection point is when uh, Ambedkar enters this debate with Gandhi in the early 1930s, right, which, which culminates in this infamous Pune Pact. Because in a way, Ambedkar is already kind of conceptualizing, um, you know, uh, the depressed classes, as he calls them as a kind of minority, right? And he's wondering how to secure representation for them, uh, you know, in, 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 in any potential plan that the British put forward uh, for a kind of uh, partial autonomy uh, and, and uh, self-representation through a kind of uh, electoral process, which then occurs a few years later in, in 1936-37 after the Government of India Act. And, you know, he and Gandhi don't agree uh, as in, you know, who's going to represent whom, who's going to, whose vote is going to count, who can stand for elections, and how does the, how does the legislature actually, you know, uh, whatever kind of legislature it is at that time, um, you know, reflect uh, the aspirations of, of voters, uh, which may be based on their identity, as it were, in that instance, based on, on their outcast status or their untouchable status. Uh, or, or their depressed status. Um, and then Ambedkar goes on to, to write a book in the early 40s about minorities uh, and Pakistan, right? And he also then is very involved in the question of defining minorities linguistically uh, for purposes of constitution making um, and the linguistic reorganization of the Indian states. So in a sense, this, this question and this problem is already deeply embedded into the very DNA of the Indian state, both in its final colonial phase and in its post-colonial phase and continuing, right? And and you you what you are giving us is the tail end of this con you know this 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 kind of convoluted story uh, where we look at Rajya Sabha and we try to correct for Lok Sabha uh, because we are always in a dilemma between. Um, the first past the four post system and the question of absolute numbers and the question of fair representation, right? Fair representation, that is the question, even for 
you know, Dalits from, from the time of, of, of the Pune Pact uh, and, and, and perhaps for Muslims in a very pointed way today. Um, so uh, there's, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, if you want to say a few words, please do. And then uh, I see one question which is now coming in. Uh, so I'll, I'll read that out to you after you've had a chance to say something. Just to make two or three quick points. One is that, you know, uh, the colonial period was different because uh, it was a limited electorate, property qualified electorate. I mean, yeah, it was not uh, it was not a full electorate. I mean, the bulk of the population yeah, it was, was a partial not, electorate. Yeah. Partial electorate. Yeah. From 52, post independence, we had a full electorate. So we are yes. stepping in that. Then, second point I'd like to make is that uh, minorities can uh, get represented effectively. I mean, talking about those who speak for them effectively, not only by only members of their own community, but also by those who depend on their votes. So there are a vast number of uh, Italy in the in the in in in, in the Congress was in power. Uh, although minority, even then it was only six percent compared to twelve percent average uh, Muslim population. Six percent was in Lok Sabha. But beyond that, there were a large number of MPs in the Lok Sabha who were maybe they were Hindus, but they depended on Muslim voters in their constituency. So they were sensitive to the needs, just like. Today in Britain or elsewhere in the US or Canada, I mean, why are they, uh, you know, British MPs and Canadian uh, Prime Minister talking about farmers? Because there are a lot of people from Punjab who are settled there and who are their constituents. So they activate their MPs. So you can get represented also by people who are not belonging to your community. I mean, it's not, we are not talking about literally only a Muslim can represent a Muslim. So, uh, that is if the question of what I raised, saliency of cleavage is not uh, important. If there is no sharp division in society uh, and in politics between majority and minority, if there are harmonious relations and minorities are not perceived as a threat or as the other. Resiliency is, is the key thing. I mean, there's a qualitative, it's not about numbers. I mean, it's about the nature of relationships in society. Yes. Uh, how that is what is deteriorating. Post the rise of the BJP, a deliberate othering has taken place resiliency of the cleavage has increased. So that now you find in the post-90s, even other parties, Congress and regional parties, which would nominate Muslim candidates are now hesitating to nominate them. They're nominating few. Fewer of them. There are numbers of uh, Muslim candidates being nominated by secular parties also gone down. Because then the BJP will bounce upon them and say, look, you are uh, pro-minority, you are just that, etc. So uh, therefore, the rise of Hindutva has meant also that both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha tickets are being given less by the secular parties also, fearing that they will be painted as being pro minor This is what we are seeing this happening in a uh, uh, number of states. Uh, and uh, so the rise of the salience of the cleavage uh, deliberately whipped up. I mean, even if you look at that earlier 6%. Muslims were getting represented. Most of them, there were only 13 Muslim majority constituents. And in 1980, there were 49 Muslim MPs in Lok Sabha. So that means there were another 36 who were getting elected from Hindu majority constituencies. And similarly, throughout, I mean, throughout the majority of Muslim candidates were being elected from non Muslim majority constituencies because the image was also salient. People at the, I mean, average voter was willing to vote for a Muslim candidate. I mean, right. Mufti Muhammad Said, who was a Kashmiri Muslim and became Home Minister of India, yeah. was elected in 1989 from Muzaffar Nagar in UP. Today, can he get elected from Muzaffar Nagar? Okay. So the saliency so, of the cleavage, saliency matters. Uh, and that's a qualitative point. It's not a quantitative point, not a statistical point. I'm just telling you, I have, two, I have two questions more that we need to get yeah. to. Uh, but no. but I, I appreciate what you're saying, which is that, you know, the question is how well integrated is society really or how how partitioned it is internally along identity lines of various kinds so that can you be confident that your interest can be represented by somebody who is different from you right that is the basic point yes. and at some point yes. people had that confidence about their leaders as well as about their voters but today parties have tended to become more and more identity based De facto, even if on paper they they continue to be, you know, uh, uh, not defining themselves uh, in this way, uh, and that pressure is coming, I think, from the right, 
uh, for everybody yeah. to behave in a similar fashion, right? Um, but in a way, I, I still want to insist that, that, you know, it was really, it was the Gandhi Ambedkar debate that kind of kicked off this issue because what was Gandhi's claim that he had and the Congress had as much of a claim to representing untouchable interests as an um, untouchable leader like Ambedkar might have, Ambedkar and others. So he was saying that identity should not be the basis of, um, uh, of voting. But he was only saying that within a Hindu framework, right? He was effectively saying Dalits are also, or as you would call them, Harijans are also Hindus. But at the same time, for Hindus and Muslims, he would acknowledge that perhaps there is, there is some differentiation to be made in terms of separate electorates. So there was an inconsistency there. Of course, by the time we get to partition, he's not of this view, right? He is going into Muslim majority areas. He says that I will go and live in Pakistan and so on, right? And so also for, for, for Ambedkar, you know, uh, uh, his, his, uh, his, his um, kind of associate Jogin Mandal is actually end him, ending up in Pakistan as a, as a, as a first uh, kind of law minister. So, so it's, you know, the, the, it's a very complicated question as to what extent you're going to tie identity to representation when you're actually trying to uphold an identity neutral principle of citizenship along with universal adult franchise. So I think that's something that you've really uh, managed to communicate, you know, this idea of social cleavage and social integration. Um, and that's very, very important. Now I have two questions here and then, you know, we must, we must really stop uh, in about five minutes. One is from Rashmi. It says, uh, Professor Sridharan, could you enlighten us as to the imperatives of political parties using the Rajya Sabha for representation of various interests, including minority representation more broadly? Okay, this is a very big question. You may have to just succinctly answer it. How do parties use this mechanism to placate or co-opt different sections? The Rajya Sabha, that is to say. And for the regional parties, how do they prefer to use uh, uh, Rajya Sabha seats to represent what kind of interests? If it's not minority interests like the Congress party, is it perhaps regional interests? Maybe, you know, maybe that's what, he, that's what uh, she means. And then there's another question from the person's uh, name is not clear. It says, what is the alternative to the first past the post system? Do we have other kinds of mechanisms to accommodate diversities from other experiences, meaning possibly in other countries or other democracies? Can we think of consociational model of democracy from the Lebanese experience, a system based on the balance among confessions, right? Um, uh, though it is also fraught with some systemic problems in the current scenarios. Oh, I see. And then the name is at the end. It's actually our colleague, uh, our friend Pervez Alam, again, from, uh, from Aligarh Muslim University. So the first question is about how are parties using uh, the Rajya Sabha other than the Congress and the BJP? And the second question is, what are the alternatives to first past the post? And if you could please uh, wrap it up in, in five minutes, then we can take a lunch break. Thank you. I'll, do, I'll wrap it up quickly. Uh, one is that Rajasabha is uh, one of the various uh, uh, things for which Rajasabha was used was to compensate Muslims for underrepresentation in the Lok Sabha by the Congress in its head when it was in power. And typically, Rajasabha is used when the major leader say, doesn't get elected in the Lok Sabha, or doesn't get a ticket, and you make him in the Rajasabha so that he is sitting in parliament. So it is actually to also accommodate leaders. The way the parties used it, all parties, was to accommodate leaders who may not get elected. You lose the election here, but you could get into Raj uh, because your party would take care of it. You know, that was uh, one of the uh, functions of getting them elected in the Rajya Sabha. Uh, and all parties used to do this. Uh, uh, then the question, uh, Professor Parvez Alam question, alternative I mean, I've got a paper on this, which was published in a volume about 18 years ago, about how we debated and adopted our electoral system first past the post in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, now, that uh, paper, I've gone into the actual Constituent Assembly debates. 
by and large, there was not very much of a debate. There was uh, some minority members actually participated strongly in the debate to talk about uh, alternative systems, including various forms of proportional representation. Now, proportional representation systems, especially those which have large assemblies and, and large number of seats uh, per constituency, tend to represent minorities better. Minorities tend to be represented closer to their population, and in a party is also closer to the population, <coughs> like in countries like Israel or Holland. Now, that uh, uh, can represent minorities better, but if you take the Israeli case, for example, or if you take the Sri Lankan case also, if there is high salience of the cleavage, and you know, people are not integrated socially, uh, then you can be sick, you can get your breath of breath, you can get your proportionate representative assembly, but you will be simply outvoted, steamrolled, you will not get any power. I mean, the Arabs sitting in the Israeli Knesset hardly have any power, the Tamils sitting in the Sri Lankan parliament hardly have any power. <coughs> so a lot depends on the salience of the cleavage. This is a it's a qualitative point, not just a numbers point. And so even if you go to proportional representation, on which I have a paper in a volume by Sudha Pai about two years ago, uh, I've talked about what if India had proportional representation and the case for it and the case against it, the pros and cons. In which I have said, yes, minorities can get more proportionally represented in parliament under proportional representation. But if there is a climate in which the salience of the cleavage is very sharp, and I said, yeah, but they won't get uh, they won't get ministerships. They won't get into the executive from them. I mean, they will basically be isolated, even in the parliament, uh, like you find in some countries, which I just named. So, uh, uh, I mean, I hope. I mean, proportional representation is a better form of representation for small parties and minorities. But if the salience of the majority minority cleavage is very big, is major. Like between Sing Singhalese and Tamils in Sri Lanka, or Arabs and Jews in Israel, or you know, in some parts of India, I mean, uh, uh, Hindu Muslim people, uh, then you may find that you may, if you even if you adopt PR systems, you will get represented according to your proportion of the population or closer to it than you would at the first past the post. But in that assembly, you will be simply a steamroller. I mean, outvoted, isolated. So cleavage salience and therefore a larger social and cultural, uh, uh, you know, the quality of relationships uh, matters. You know, whether people see you as the other or not, or they see you as part of the society. Yeah, so I think uh, we've had a very rich discussion, really, this whole morning has been so excellent already, if I say so myself, um, you know, from, from, uh, uh, from Prashanta beginning to, to talk about uh, questions of honor, questions of leadership, questions of, uh, you know, the populace as such, um, uh, to uh, Hilal really querying the category, the very category of the minority uh, in, in India's uh, political uh, uh, history and, uh, you know, the, his the cultural politics. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you... Uh, appearing to really look at a question you know with in 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 terms of uh, in terms that are very kind of uh, in numerical and statistical but really going you know through that to the question of social cleavage uh, and social integration which which brings up you know the issue of who represents who and 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 through what do we define our affinities, our solidarities, and our identities in a political field? Uh, as you know, when you go up as a voter to cast your vote, you know how are you voting? Uh, you know uh, what kind of leadership are you uh, opting for? What kind of party are you opting for? That is not a simple arithmetic uh, of of numbers, uh, and it's not even a simple uh, definition of uh, your identity. You know there are multiple factors at play, and I think that that becomes uh, very clear. Um, and I also appreciate that you brought up comparative cases. Uh, you know where 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 there isn't first past the post, there is proportional representation, but the societies are so highly divided, like in Israel, for example, or in Sri Lanka, um, that uh, you know uh, in order to actually reduce 
uh, the numbers of of the of the the enemy community i mean you may end up uh, you know uh, with uh, genocidal violence uh, and 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 this is an extreme kind of reaction to to this idea of of uh, of proportional representation so that introduces you know new distortions um, um, and maybe we are better off uh, in a, with our system okay so now according to my uh, watch here it's 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 125 indian standard time uh, and i do want to begin again at 2 pm indian standard time uh, so I would say, please, uh, I'm sorry, you can't have an hour's break uh, for breakfast, uh, lunch, or dinner, depending on what time frame you're in, time zone. Um, we will reconvene essentially in half an hour uh, at uh, 2 p.m. Um, and uh, we will proceed with uh, the next paper, uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Mujibur Rahman from uh, the Jamia Millia uh, Islamia University. So thank you so much, and we are dispersing for half an hour. Thank you. Uh, will you? OK, uh, so um, welcome back to those of you who are rejoining after a very wonderful session this morning. Uh, in our conference on uh, populism and minorities, new directions in research from the humanities and social sciences. I'm Ananya Vajpayee. I'm at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi, uh, and I'm speaking from my office. It's, uh, it's 2 p.m. Uh, in Indian Standard Time. Um, and we already had uh, three wonderful papers uh, in the morning. And now in our post lunch session, we have two papers for you. Uh, the first one by uh, Dr. Mujibur Rahman and uh, the, the final one for today by uh, Professor Christophe Jaffrelo. So uh, let me uh, introduce my friend uh, Mujib. Um, I've, I've known Mujib for many years. He teaches, uh, you know, across the city at uh, uh, Jamia Millia uh, University. Uh, and we've met many times there as well as elsewhere at conferences and book events. Um, but I only recently discovered that he's actually a classmate and a batchmate of some of my colleagues here at the center, which I, I didn't know before uh, last week. Um, he um, has a book forthcoming uh, called Shikwa -e Hind which I assume is based on, uh, on Iqbal's uh, uh, poem. Uh, that the, the title is taken from there, uh, Shikwa and Jawab e Shikwa, right? Um, and it, it, the, the, the subtitle is The Political Future of Indian Muslims, a very crucial question indeed. It's forthcoming from Simon and Schuster later this year. Um, he's also published a couple of uh, edited uh, volumes um, uh, one is on communalism in post-colonial India uh, from Rutledge, and the other is uh, titled The Rise of Saffron Power, uh, also from Rutledge. Um, and um, he is actually, he has contributed to the volume that, um, that uh, Volker and I have edited. And um, he's going to be presenting today um, on a topic which reads, uh, Muslim identity debate in the era of populism, reflections on the Indian case. So uh, I'll give you 20 minutes, uh, Mujib, and if you'd like to share your screen, please do that. And I invite questions uh, in the Q&A box um, from, from participants and attendees. Uh, yeah, just let me, uh, when it's five minutes to 20, I'll try to wrap it up before 20 minutes. And... But it would be helpful if you can just sound me around. Send me an alert after 15 minutes or so. Dr. Bajpay, should I start now? Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. Please yeah. start. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon to all. Thanks uh, for your kind introduction and uh, thanks for putting together this uh, very interesting and important workshop and four volumes. And uh, I'm very glad that, that uh, I'd also look forward to listening to Professor Jaffa a lot. Uh, his presentation which is not very different from mine. So I'm glad that I'm going ahead of him. 
otherwise I might have run out of facts. Um, this presentation is very different. I'm departing from what I contributed to the volume based on that conference in which we are together in Venice. <clears throat> uh, this is about uh, how Muslim issues are debated and what are the possible implications in the context of uh, the populism phenomena that we have witnessed, or more specifically in the context of Hindutva. As uh, it is widely argued by scholars that populism is not an ideology. And the question is, what is it? And what is its relationship with ideology? And how is it, uh, and how are we going to understand or explain the Hindutva brand, a variety of populism and its implications for Indian politics? Uh, uh, Professor Jaffer in his last lecture, uh, you know, made it very clear that it is not an ideology. And that's, an, that's a position that even Partha Chatterjee says. So in his book, uh, and I feel very comfortable and agree with him when he explains uh, with the help of Ernest Laclau's analysis of populism, Chatterjee says, Laclau has proposed an analytical framework for understanding of populism, not as a distortion or pathology, but political reason operating in a democracy. Populism is not defined by particular political or ideological content, rather it structures in particular ways the representation of whatever political content it articulates. I think this is roughly what Professor Jaffer Lott also uh, says with respect to populism when he says that it's what I gathered after listening to your lecture on populism. Some of the new literature based on the works of new populist movements in Europe and elsewhere in, in US, scholars have argued that populism is a degraded form of democracy. It is characterized by anti-elitism, anti-pluralism, and exclusionary identity politics. Thus, Zaha Muller argues that the populists in power seek to hijack the state machinery, engage in mass clientelism, and suppress society, suppress civil society. We all we see all these trends in Indian politics today, and there is a consensus among scholars that Modi is a populist leader. And uh, you know, Dr. Bajpay in her introduction in, in the volume in the chapter. Uh, distinguishes uh, Modi as a populist leader compared to other leaders who preceded him by identifying three factors. The first is that his Janus-faced messaging. Second is his expert deployment of media, print and electronic and others. And thirdly, crafting a public persona of himself, uh, more of a cult figure. So this is broadly the context in which I'm going to discuss three specific Muslim issues, which are very contemporary in nature. One is the citizenship debate of 2019. Second issue is the lynching. And the third is the triple talaq and uniform civil court debate. But I want to before preface my uh, discussion on these three issues with a few remarks and a caveat. First is that there is a general argument whenever there is a discussion on the Hindu right politics in India, that this is part of a rise of the global religious right movement. I have never felt very comfortable with that particular analysis. I suggested that this connection is circumstantial than causal. India's Hindu right has not risen just because there was a global religious right that's emerging has already emerged in the past few years in the West or elsewhere. <coughs> Second is, in order to understand this particular, uh, just to elaborate on this, to understand what is unfolding because of BJP's politics or Hindu rights politics, we need to go beyond the conventional political party analysis. We have to go back to 100 years, to the years of, to the era of 1920s, and look at Indian political landscape of that particular time in colonial India. What we see is that there were three dominant political forces who were essentially have a shared goal. They were interested to remove the colonial 
power. They worked in tandem, but each of them had a different ideological vision for India once the BJP, once the Britishers depart. The first major dominant force was Congress and the left who believed in secular politics. The second was Muslim League, which asked for a campaign for separate homeland. Third was Hindu right, which wanted a Hindu state or Hindu Rashtra. By 1940s, two of them became moderately successful. Hindu right was a marginal force in Indian politics. Since then, Hindu right has been able to gradually gain momentum, spread its wings, and has emerged as an hegemonic political force in India. Following the rules that was laid out by secular political forces through a secular constitution. Therefore, what we see today is essentially an outcome of an ideological movement, which is trying to brush India with the help of its own understanding of politics, history and issues of other citizens, such as Muslims. The second thing that I want to point out is that this Hindu majoritarianism is a very unique type of majoritarianism, very different from the Muslim majoritarianism that dominated, created and dominated the politics of Pakistan, or white majoritarianism that leads to white supremacy politics. The primary difference between the two is this, that this majoritarianism, the ideologues who formulated who basically run the soul are essentially fall into caste group that's broadly, you know, in a moderate assessment would be less than 10% of its population. In other words, they are not indeed a majority. It is a minority which formulates a majoritarian idea then sells it to its majority and its, its, its constituency under umbrella identity of Hindu and has been moving forward. In fact, Professor Jaffa Lord's chapter one, Stimulating and Stigmatizing Others, has a detailed description of founding members of, of, of these organizations and their caste background. Therefore, the argument of Arjun Appadurai, fear of small numbers, do not really apply because it is a minority which is creating an imaginary fear against another minority by producing a majoritarian ideology and legitimizing it through various organizations and campaigns. In an important study, Amrita Basu, in a book called Violent Conjectures, had arrived at this conclusion, where, uh, wherever this upper caste have supported BJP, the anti-minority violence have increased. The field work was done in Gujarat, Himachal Pradesh, and Uttar Pradesh. So it's very important to pay attention to this particular fact to make sense of Hindu majoritarianism and its dynamics. Now, <clears throat> what is the perception of Hindu right with regard to Muslims? Hindu right is deeply uncomfortable with the idea of Hindu right as a citizen or equal citizen. That's quite well known. More importantly, in the literature will come across that it is uncomfortable with the idea of Muslims as even human beings. So there are all these descriptions by its founding fathers that Muslims are snakes. For instance, Sadhvi Tamwara in a speech at BHP rally in New Delhi once said, Muslims are like a pinch of sugar, should sweeten a glass of milk, instead like a lemon, they sour it. When they don't realize it, that a squeezed lemon is thrown away while the milk that has been curdled solidifies into paneer. So Muslims have two choices, either to live like a sugar or like a rung lemons. So the, in the imagination of Hindu right, Muslims are indeed not human beings. Often scholars have argued ever since the rise of BJP that the political project essentially means that Muslims should be treated as second class citizens. The fact is that in pre-BJP India, uh, Muslims have, the bulk of Muslims have always been treated as second class citizens. There's enough documentation to, to suggest that. So the primary objective, I argue, of, of Hindu right is essentially to de-Islamize India. It was uh, most explicitly 
uh, expressed in a statement by Ananta Kumar Hegede of Karnataka, the former minister. Until we uproot Islam, we cannot remove terrorism. Now coming back to the question of citizenship debate. It is widely known that citizenship is exclusionary. Therefore, it fundamentally unleashes an assault on the secular foundation of Indian constitution. It selectively excludes Muslims from the Muslim majority country under the argument that Muslims are not discriminated in Islamic republics. Now, one particular question is that then why should the primary argument that, that the state gives or the home minister has given is that. Now, the question is that which community today is most fiercely persecuted on religious lines, the Rohingyas or Burma? But then the citizenship is not open to them because the explanation is Rohingyas pass through Bangladesh and since they take the Bangladesh route, Bangladeshi and therefore they should not be given citizenship. The basic argument, however, the basic logic it seems to me is this, basically because the attempt is to prevent any Muslim to come to India, therefore all kinds of arguments are invented in order to justify those exclusion. Similar argument could be made with respect to Bangladeshi refugees. It's unfortunate and it is quite well known that, that it's the Muslim Bangladeshi refugees which are the target of the government citizenship policy. Now, if you look at the modern Indian history, not even more than two generations ago, the ancestors of this Bangladeshi refugees were Indians. Hindu right that finds inspiration in the European politics of 1930s should know that if you are a German, even if you are able to establish it after 200 years, you can get German citizenship. However, Bangladeshi refugees, even if their ancestors were Indians, we do not have that consideration for them just because that they belong to a particular religion. In part, this has something to do with the kind of discourse that we have laid with respect to partition. It is argued that partition was essentially a Muslim project since it has been successful. Therefore, they should have no say with respect to India. No, they should not ask for any benefits from India. But the fact remains that partition was an elite project. Vast number of Muslims had no direct say on the decision. Most of them found themselves helpless and stayed back. And most people who become refugees from Bangladesh are essentially people who have extreme socioeconomic conditions, not that they have the option to migrate to developed countries. Ironically, we take a great pride in our role in creating Bangladesh. One of the reasons we justify in our involvement in supporting Bangladesh Liberation War was that we were concerned about the dignity of those people. If we were concerned in those days for the dignity of the people, what is wrong being concerned about the dignity today? Unfortunately, we don't have even intellectual voice or moral voice of that kind to analyze these questions and present these arguments. Something that Slavok Zizek has done in his book against double blackmail with respect to the refugees in Europe. And the question of lynching. It so happens that it's very likely that given the way that the politics has developed or developing, it is unlikely that lynching is going to stop anytime soon. Fortunately, the Supreme Court has ordered, had given an instruction that the government should form a law, a separate law, in order to instill a fear in the minds of perpetrators. Modi government has remained indifferent to this, though it was very sincere in implementing the Supreme Court order with respect to Ajodhya Temple. Unfortunately, all political parties have remained indifferent to this particular issue. It is almost a non-issue for most political parties. We don't see it as a campaign theme or agenda, a part of campaign agenda in any of the political parties, either before 29 or during the present uh, assembly elections. This is again that, that violence against Muslims is desirable or even acceptable, and it is very normal. That is how one of the ministers of the Modi government explained in the Parliament of India when there was a request that, that whether 
it should be it as a separate for there is no separate documentation of lynching by the indian state uh, now let me just come to the last thing and say a few words and then i'll conclude with respect to the uniform civil code ever since the passage of triple talaq there is a perception among the members of hindu right parties that it is a matter of time uniform civil code should be passed and most liberal thinkers of progressive citizens are in a dilemma because many of them were opposed to triple talaq and it's a good thing that happened other than few clauses particularly the one that deals with the criminalization of husbands but it is something that is not practiced in most islamic countries or muslim countries so it was there was no reason why it should have stayed here but in a manner last 60 70 years this whole debate has taken place there is a general perception that it is only muslim community which wants a separate which is not interested for uniform civil code as if the hindu civil code was very progressive and pro woman flavia agnes in a paper on this highlights particular aspects of special marriage act and few other sections of hindu code which are very patriarchal which should not be part of uniform civil code so there is a fear among the some groups of minority communities not all that that uniform civil code could probably be basically an attempt to impose hindu code on muslim communities so the fact remains that there is never there has never been a serious full fledged political debate on this particular issue but a negative perception with respect to muslim community has been generated partly also because in a manner that the conservative muslims have taken position with respect to sahano case unfortunately indian state has always stood beside the conservative muslims and muslim liberals have been the targets of it or uh, have been ignored or often uh, were not given much attention by the supposedly secular political elites of india of various regimes so to conclude in the era of hindutva populism there is a general environment that denies muslim community for any sensible political reasoning to ask for equality to ask for dignity and all these attempts are essentially made in order to uh, deny all those uh, rights and all those dignities that the community uh, otherwise deserves as as a citizen in modern times thank you thank you mujib uh that was very very uh, punctual of you um i uh invite uh, participants attendees panelists um anybody who's joined on zoom to to please type in your question now uh, in the q and a box because we'll run out of time very soon um in the meantime just to get us going uh, actually i had uh, a question for you mujib um actually two questions for you one is um can you say in in so many words what uh, you know can you answer the question that you asked in a sense that what is the future of the muslim community in india um you know i mean i i gathered from your account that things are going from bad to worse and we all know that and we see that every day but uh i mean do you see an end point do you see a reversal do you see a plateauing of a normalization of this process what is your uh, sort of uh, you know forecast as it were um and the second question i wanted to ask was that um you know in a you you ended by saying that you know muslims are struggling for equality right now the hindu right argues that uh you know they can't struggle for something they already have uh because by definition you know we are equal citizens uh, all regardless of our religion and 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 gender and uh, any other kind of identity vector um 
and on the other hand uh, you know effectively we know that uh, from the sachar committee report and so on that um, you know in, that muslims in many ways are second class citizens so there's a there's a difference between you know the de facto and de jure kind of uh, uh status in terms of equality and all kinds of economic indicators of, of backwardness and 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 uh you know development and and so on uh and as well as political and and cultural indicators as well there is a serious lag there um so so yeah so tell me this i mean one what do you what do you where do you see this process actually ending up uh in in you know in some foreseeable future uh and to um you know uh when when one section of the population has to struggle all over again to to count uh you know and and arguably this is true of dalits as well then you know what does that say about the sort of ground rules uh have those been have those been effectively you know uh negated uh, over the course of the last 72 years uh you to the first question in fact the easy way of saying is that and i would be really happy to send you a copy of my book for <laughs> to look at it uh and that's exactly what i attempt to answer uh the question is that, that the political future of indian muslims is very bleak looking at statistically or arithmetically today just you know, a little louder please just slightly louder and and yeah yeah uh, uh looking at uh, looking at indian politics today you have bjp which has roughly around 35 36 37% uh, of votes so you have practically more than 60% of people who are voters who are opposed to hindutva politics and out of that 30 plus 35 plus percentages of voters most of them are not on board on the hindutva agenda but what is arithmetically possible is not politically feasible so when one looks at the political trends it's very unlikely that uh, bjp would remain a major force and uh, it is apparent that congress is not in an ideological fight it is on decline it is there are no signs of its revival it's very unlikely to revive and uh, most regional political parties are essentially dynastic so i don't and and past elections as shown since 2014 there has been no attempt to put together a fight of the kind that we saw in 77 or 89 or 96 uh, among politicians even a temporary arrangement uh, so obviously uh, bjp is has a tremendous electoral future uh and and it has done considerable amount of damage and likely to do more damage in our understanding for in next few years or in next few terms that it will india so fundamentally uh, as i have argued in my book uh, that that internally even if the word secular exists internally the political system has been turned to saffron system that the majoritarian agenda has been pursued relentlessly and uh, so obviously there is very little future for muslims uh, more importantly that muslims are deliberately as an electoral strategy and excluded from major institutions from assemblies and parliament uh, about his issue that i spoke about so gradually we see that the political voice is is going to be minimized or reduced in a very significant manner and uh, bjp would essentially take call the sort that this is the sort of law that you need this is the sort of policies that you need this is the way that you have to live in this country which has been a position that it has taken and whenever people ask say for instance uh, after article 370 removal somebody asked jagdish khatter of rnc minister how do you think that muslims should uh, what about muslims should they live in this country or not he said you know they have to live in this country uh, by respecting our customs and traditions and all of that about it that very assumption tells you that you are not equal uh why not the majority community respect the traditions and customs of other communities not necessarily the muslims but others about it so obviously there is a tremendous amount of oh no, the future is gloom uh, gloom very gloomy in terms of uh, this things about it and i personally don't see a fight back either by political parties or by the community itself my own sense is this community probably not in a position even to figure out where it is Uh, i think the real challenge to muslim community would arrive after modi 
whatever little bit of decency you see in terms of this, I mean, that would disappear and disintegrate after Modi and BJP would be of a very different kind of BJP in the post Modi era about it. So, so that's how I would like to uh, come down. It's a very dark, uh, <laughs> dark set of predictions. Um, I mean, I, I shudder to think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I, I can, I can see, you know, that you're probably not wrong, but, uh, but there is, there is a, you know, there's a sense in which this kind of scenario also um, assumes a, a lack of agency and a lack of resistance, which in fact, we, we saw a, a, a great upsurge of, uh, you know, self-assertion um, uh, uh, in a completely leaderless and unorganized fashion, you know, uh, from students, Muslim students, Muslim campuses, uh, culminating in Shaheen Bagh, uh, you know, just uh, just about, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, there are obviously energies counteracting this kind of inevitability of, uh, you know, the Hinduization of, of, of India. Um, I mean, it's not going to be easy for them, uh, but, but they're, they're there somewhere, right? And uh, we can only hope that uh, various forms of uh, grassroots mobilization will uh, ultimately kind of present themselves unexpectedly, perhaps, uh, uh, you know. And Ashish Nandi has recently uh, also stated that he does feel hope. He does feel political hope uh, based on, on a moment like Shaheen Bagh. Uh, I'm sorry, at the very last second now, somebody's uh, asked you a question. So we'll just take a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, Mujib, I'm sorry, we're going to have to keep it short. Uh, it's somebody called Naresh. And, and uh, he says, you say that the rise of Hindutva is rather circumstantial. But can you really divorce it from the way forces of social justice have suffered over all these years? Meaning, uh, I think he's, I think he's probably asking that, that there's been there's been some sort of ongoing injustice done to Hindus mm -hmm. and that Hindutva is a response to that. Uh, I think that's the, that's the tenor of the question, but please just take a minute and then we'll move on. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, well, well, I say that, that this connection between the Hindu right and the rise of global right is circumstantial, not causal, because Hindu right is an old movement of hundred years and in its long journey of hundred years, Many secular forces have often become its partners. Some of them have become the direct victims of it or targets of, of it. Say Mamata Banerjee, Abdullahs, they were all partners of this movement at one point of time in the form of coalition governments and all of that stuff of it. Uh, so far as the injustice to Hindus are concerned, I think uh, if you look back to Ambedkar or Kansi Ram, more injustice has been done to Hindus by Hindus themselves. That is a narrative that is drowned in this majoritarian narrative that uh, the upper caste-led Hindutva movement has has presented, uh, you know, so so it's not exactly the Muslims who are primarily less. Even today, if you look at atrocities on Dalits, uh, uh, a vast number of atrocities on Dalits are committed by non-Muslims, so mostly by upper caste Hindus in various parts of India. Not not Muslims are involved in it, but that is how the campaign is or propaganda is. One of the things that Hindu rights should be given credit for, uh, in which it succeeded. Sorry, we've lost you, Majib. You're frozen. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, I think uh, one of the things that we have to give credit to the Hindu right movements is this that propaganda in which they have converted one of the poorest religious minority in the world into one of the most pampered communities, Ajit, which is entitled or has benefited tremendously through wrong means in this whole argument and boggy of appeasement for instance, about it. You know, going back to your comment quickly in two sentences, Muslim population today is roughly 180 million or 90 million today, which is almost the double the population of Muslims at the time of partition 
when they lived in a far larger area, including Pakistan and Bangladesh so today. About it. If you compare, and that's the population which is greater than the population of Germany and France put together. And now, if you look at the sort of protest that, that even anti-CA protest uh, you know, that we saw, uh, it does not reflect uh, a protest of 200, close to 200 million strong political community. Uh, you know, so, 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 you know, I understand why, you know, there are many, like Akhil Bilgram has said that, that this is a major upsurge after Khilafat among Muslim community. And a lot of people have said a lot of nice things about the constitutional Muslim uh, or the constitutional awareness among Muslims about their rights. In the, in the scheme of things of what we have witnessed in last 30, 40 years, maybe it is encouraging, but when we look at the potential of the community and what we see to what we have seen, uh, you know, uh, you know, one doesn't see a proper match over there about it. So, so one of the questions that I have been asked that, you know, after lynching that why Muslims did not protest. Muslims barely protested after lynching. It was a secular protest against lynching. It was the minister and her, her head rolled who was a, a recruit of, of, of the powerful prime minister of India. Muslims barely protested uh, after this. Mostly it's the artists, intellectuals and secularists who protested after lynching. And even today, there has not been much of an organized protest about lynching. Uh, there is no organized attempt by Muslims to ask political parties, they, you know, why don't you have a separate law? Court has asked us for a law, why don't you have a separate law about it? So, so these are the signs that shows that, that how politically inequipped. In my understanding, the famous advice that Ambedkar gave to Dalits several uh, decades ago, organize, educate, and agitate, uh, applies to Muslims today more than it ever applied to this community. And it would be nice if the Muslim community pays attention to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mujib. I'm sorry to rush you, but you know, we have to move on. There is actually another question, uh, but I'm just going to read it out and then we'll park it. And if after Christoph's done, then we can come back to it if people want to. Uh, Somebody is asking, again, there's no name. Uh, don't you think that the strategies of the BJP are falling apart when they ch have forced, they're forced to change their stance on CAA in Bengal and Assam? But I, I, we can't go into it now. So I'm going to move on uh, to our final speaker for today. Um, um, somebody uh, who's very, very familiar to us uh, here at uh, CSDS, an old friend of the center, an old colleague of the center, uh, recently gave um, uh, a, a, a brilliant uh, talk on populism, in fact, uh, in our uh, talk series. And at the time, the, there were rumors that the government was trying to introduce a new, um, uh, uh, you know, rule uh, as regards uh, inviting foreign speakers and having to get permission from, uh, you know, the Ministry of External Affairs every time we had uh, somebody uh, like Christoph uh, speaking. Uh, and we really honestly, at, at that moment, we thought this is the last lecture we, we will be allowed to have. Uh, but what a lecture it was. <laughs> and, and, and fortunately, of course, that, that rule was, was recanted even before it, it went into force. Um, so uh, uh, Professor Jaffre Lowe is a research director at uh, SERI Sciences Po, uh, and the uh, uh, Center for, uh, you know, uh, the National Center for uh, Advanced Research um, in Paris. Um, and he's also a professor of Indian politics and sociology uh, at the King's College in London. Um, and um, actually, you know, his is the fifth volume in a sense that, that uh, you know, that really is as much a part of this discussion as, uh, as, as the other four. Um, um, it's, it's also a, a co-edited volume that he and Tom Blom Hansen and Angana Chatterjee have put together. You can see the, you can see the cover, uh, Majoritarian State, How Hindu Nationalism is Changing India. Um, and um, this came out in uh, 2019 from Hearst, from OUP, and from HarperCollins in different parts of the world. Um, and Christoph uh, has also contributed to the volume that uh, Volker and I have edited. Um, uh, interestingly, in that instance, he wanted to, uh, you know, focus on Pakistan because uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, enough, uh, enough sort of uh, uh, data for comparison uh, between India and Pakistan, and he was able to provide that. Um, 
and um you know he's done such extensive work over so many books over so many years on every aspect of caste communalism you know all kinds of uh, electoral politics uh, democratic politics um uh, and uh, cultural politics uh, in south asia and especially in india that i mean almost there's no aspect of this problem that his work has not addressed in in one or other of his books and articles which are too numerous to list um so today he's going to just take a slice out of that that you know speaks to our conversation in this particular round table and he's going to speak on how far is national populism against uh, minorities thank you thank you very much ananya thank you for um, inviting me and um, of course i would very much prefer to be on 29 rajpur road um, hopefully that will be possible again one day and uh, we'll have proper proper seminars and, and proper tea breaks um yes this is a very timely question and, and like mujib i'm not uh, dealing with the same issue uh, i covered uh, in the book you co-edited uh, but uh, yes i've shifted to i'm back to india in a way looking at the relationship between populism and, and minorities um in india in present day and in in and in also uh, in the past Well let me let me begin with some theory not much but some theory because i do think that the most common definitions of populism are very much revealing of its structural relation to minorities if you for instance uh, read cas muder you see that he defines populism as i quote a thin centered ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic camps the pure people versus the corrupt elite while the elite is necessarily a minority and uh, the pure people is the constituency the populist leader will will target and will try to mobilize Laclau uh, would say something similar um, Mujib has just referred referred to him and I'm not I'm not going to cite too many authors the i is clearly for the populist to target a tiny minority uh, the elite the establishment but to target also sometimes ethnic minorities and in that case if it's in a variant of populism that uh, Gino Germani uh, has called national populism it's a kind of variety of populism when the lead, the populist leader indulges in uh, national populism then he doesn't claim to represent the entire populace but only the majority community be defined by its language race religion the sons of the soil and the national populist leader will try to mobilize this the other be they migrants uh, descendants of former conquerors religious minorities So if you want standard populism the way Kasmudo defines it and national populism the way uh, Gino Germani uh, defines it have one thing in common they are supposed to help populist politicians to make political majorities to mobilize political majorities and in the case of national populism the idea is to make the ethnic majority coincide with a political majority and that's why they need elections and, and that was one of the themes of my last talk at CSDS recently even when the indulging authoritarianism populist organize elections for this coincidence or uh, co-terminus 
development of political majority and ethnic majority to be reactivated at least uh, every five years. So the only difference between standard populism as defined by Moodle and national populism as defined by Germany is this, that in the case of national populism, there is an attempt at making the political majority and the ethnic majority coincide. In this presentation, what I'm going to do now is to show how Narendra Modi, when he was ruling Gujarat, as as of course mostly Muslims, but he has also attacked the ruling elite. And um, in the second section of my presentation, I'll try to show how this combination was, was so effective. But let me begin with the first point. Uh, the way Modi invented populist polarization in Gujarat after 2002, in 2002. Polarization was something BGP was very much uh, expert of. If you remember Advani's Ratyatra, the wave of riots, 89, and subsequently, you could see that they that was an old strategy of BGP, but, but Modi added something new to this. He added a populist style. And that's why I, I, I consider 2002 as the starting point of uh, a populist uh, polarization. To understand what we mean by a populist style, uh, we can go back to another theoretician of, of populism, and that's the last one I will, I will cite, Pierre Ostigi, was very aptly demonstrated the specificity of the relationship between the populist leader and, uh, uh, and, and the people. Now, the, the populist leader for Ostigi is a conduit for expressing the resentment and even the revenge of those on the bottom. Not, not necessarily because he comes from a plebeian background, but because he tries to share the culture of the plebeians, their manners, their language, by opposition to the elite's property. So the populists act like the people, try to speak like the people, and transgress the codes of good behavior, shocking the establishment in the name of what he claims to be authenticity. So because of their cosmopolitanism, um, be they um, bourgeois or uh, English speaking uh, in a country where English speakers are in a minority. Why is it so important, this style? Because that results in a repertoire of victimization. You know, the populist leader can claim that he is a victim the same way the people are victims of the establishment. So, on the one hand, the populist style will be based on this kind of plebeianization and victimization. On the other hand, of course, the populist leader is the savior of the people, its protector, a kind of Superman a hero. So these are the two sides of the same coin that we can consider as the populist style. And Modi in 2002 will use this repertoire. And I would say it would, um, invest in four directions, victimization, communication, stigmatization, and protection. And let me review this quickly. Well, in terms of victimization, it's very interesting to understand and to return to the manner in which Modi justified the organization of state elections in 2002. Elections should have taken place in February 2003, but he wanted to capitalize on the polarization due to the pogrom. And two, I, sit, I cite, seek a fresh mandate from the people of Gujarat. Let me read what I think is the first populist discourse of Modi in the um, month of July 2002. In the pretext of the Godra incident and its aftermath, 
efforts were made to pressurize Gujarat. Power angry forces stooped to the lowest possible level and made a united effort to devolve the prestige of Gujarat. These elements now try to portray Gujaratis as rapists to the rest of the world. Those who nurture such elements insulted five crore Gujaratis by describing Gujarat as God says Gujarat. The best spirit of democracy is to go to the people. So we again seek your blessings in the form of people's mandate. After the elections, we want to march forward with fresh air and new trust. The people of Gujarat are awaiting an opportunity to teach a lesson to those who played with the pride of Gujarat. And so I submit my resignation of my cabinet and at the feet of the five for people of Gujarat. That's a populist discourse is going to the people to get a fresh mandate and he appears as one of the victims of, of the others. A, victims, a victim mostly of the English media, a victim of NDTV in particular. That's the victimization part, justifying the elections. Now in terms of communication, now Modi related directly to the Gujarati voters in a very effective manner. Probably no Gujarati politician had gone to the people the way it did, launching a huge statewide election campaign known as Gorav Yatra, the pride uh, procession or pilgrimage. Uh, and during this tour, Modi was introduced at the Indur Samarat, the emperor of Hindu earth. He covered 4,200 kilometers and visited 146 constituencies holding 400 rallies, communication. Third, stigmatization. Modi targeted Muslims in this campaign as a minority, here we are, threatening Hindus in two different ways, demographically as well as physically. During the tour, Modi's speeches were peppered with anti-Muslim references. For instance, on September 9, in Mesana district, he claimed at a rally Muslim philosophy is Ampanch Amaripachis. And of course, the campaign was also directly oriented towards Muslims as posing an Islamist threat. In a speech he made recently, sorry, soon after the one I've just cited, he said, Besides the proxy war in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan has perpetrated semi-terrorism in Gujarat, and the beginning was made by Godra carnage, bracketing together Indian Muslims and, and Pakistan. And during this 2002 election campaign, there was a very striking television commercial by BGP that began with the sound of a train pulling into a, the station, followed by the clamor of riots and women's screams, before the ringing of temple bells was covered by the Dean of Automatic Rifle Fire in relation, in, in reference to the Akshar Dam uh, attacks of September 2002. And a few frames later, Modi's reassuring countenance appeared, hinting to voters that only he could protect Gujarat from such violence. Protection. We've seen victimization, communication, stigmatization, and protection. These were the four pillars of the first indulging in uh, anti-minority national populism. Now, we need to open a little bit more this, this box with four corners or, or this is corners. And I would as, add one, one shun after stigmatization, victimization, communication and protection, emotions. What are the emotions is playing with? Well, mostly fear and anger. And, and to cement a political majority, national populists exploit the ethnic majority's feelings of vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis minorities. 
I, I would not return to what Arjun Apadurai said about the fear of small numbers. Uh, I think they do apply to Gujarat, where Muslims are less than 10%. But what I would emphasize instead is the fact that it's easy to convert fear into anger when you speak to a majority. Majorities should not fear minorities. If you make them feel fear vis-a-vis -vis minorities, they're bound, they're bound to, to be angry, angry about their fear. And that's something the Song Parivar has understood very well. Um, I'd like to cite an interview Prashant Jha did in Uttar Pradesh in 2017. It's not Gujarat 2002, but it's very similar. One local BGP leader explains Prashant Jha that the party is trying to portray Hindus as the victims of Muslims. The point is to show we are the victims. This will get Hindu angry. They will then realize they have to unite against the Muslims. And this is one of the uh, reasons why they use the notion of a pink revolution that Modi, in fact, introduced in Gujarat in 2012. Uh, I, I, I cite again, when you think of these slaughterhouses, what images come to your mind? I think of Muslim butchers, cow slaughter and blood on the streets. I think of how the Muslims have taken over our public life, how they, have, they are destroying our culture and lifestyle, of how there are chicken and meat shops everywhere, and how they have become rich doing this. By raising it, we want to wake up the Hindu, get him hungry. Well, that's what uh, the national populist does when he uses uh, emotion, fear, to be turned into anger. Uh, and, and, and this mechanism is rather well, uh, I think, um, understood these days. What I want to do in the, in the five minutes I've left is to see that uh, Narendra Modi has been able in Gujarat to combine this instrumentalization of the uh, religious minorities with another one for mobilizing the people, not only against the minority, but also against the rulers. But I'll take only five minutes to show that he repeated the same strategies vis-a-vis -vis the Nehru Gandhis. Now, it's interesting to see that uh, many populist leaders, including Duterte in Philippines today, claim that they represent the people, not only because they have some plebeian background, but also because they come from the geographical periphery of their country. And Modi, when he was chief minister of Gujarat, kept saying that he was a victim, victimization again, a victim of the center. As head of a peripheral state, he cast himself as a victim by saying, I have never been facing negativism. I have been facing neg negativism of the center at every front. It often appears as if they are dealing with an enemy nation when it comes to Gujarat. Or in the 2012 election campaign, of all the chief ministers that the country has seen in the last 60 years, I have suffered the maximum injustice at the ends of the center. Victimization again, but the center is represented by the Nehru Gandhi. You know, we, we, we see today how everything wrong in India is attributed to Nehru. Well, Modi started to do that in Gujarat a long time ago. For instance, he said, people of Gujarat had to launch the Narv Nirman Andalan because of the hostility of Nehru to the making of Gujarat. I cite, historically, the Nehru Parivar doesn't like any Gujarati leader. They treated Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel badly, they treated Moraji Desai badly, now it's my turn to be targeted by them. The Nehru Gandhis have been targeted because they are corrupt. Earlier, the money used to get swallowed. I don't have 
near and dear ones, the six Krogujaratis are my family and their happiness is mine. This is a way to contrast with the way the Nehru Gandhis are seen as a dynasty and a corrupt dynasty. But they're not only financially and morally corrupt, they're also anti-national by birth. Very interesting to look at the way uh, Modi targeted Sonia Gandhi as early as 2007, as if the rival, the adversary, was not the state congressman, but uh, the leader of Congress at the center. What kind of people of, are these congressmen? They can regard an Italian woman as their own, but they find a son of the soil like me and an outsider. Here we are. What he does here is to bring together the standard dimension of populism. Sonia Gandhi represents the establishment and the minority, ethnic minority dimension of national populism. She is, she is an Italian, which means that she's a Christian. And the style is something that reminds us of Trump. He calls Sonia Basta Ben or Shetnangan. Uh, the anti Christian dimension of Modi's anti minority discourse was very obvious already in 2002 when the Chief Election Commissioner, James Michael Lingdo, was targeted by Modi because he did not want to organize elections till refugees would be in camps. And he says, it seems that Lingdo, a Christian by faith, is being guided by another of his community, Sonia Gandhi. And uh, uh, Modi said in a, in, a, in a speech in 2002, uh, Lingdo and Mrs. Gandhi could be meeting in a church. So you see the way both dimensions of um, populism can be bracketed together. And last but not least, Congress and the Sonia and Sonia Gandhi and, and Rahul Gandhi, I mean the, the Gandhi Nehru family at large, were of course targeted also because of their pro-Muslim attitude. You may remember that in 2007, Sonia Gandhi conversed in Gujarat calling the BGP leaders merchants of death because of the 2002 pogrom. In a meeting in Godra, Modi responded, the Congress says you are terrorist. Are you a terrorist? This is an insult, an insult to Gandhi's and, Pat and Sada Patel's Gujarat. Teach the Congress a lesson for calling the people of Gujarat terrorist. Sonia Ben. It is your government that is protector of merchants of death. In Gujarat, we have eliminated the merchant of death. Sonia Ben, if you cannot hang Aswal Guru and him over to Gujarat, we will hang him. And in the same vein, in 2007, soon after, Modi started to describe the government of Delhi as the Delhi Sultanate, a way to suggest that uh, the Congress was pampering Muslims in such a way that uh, he could also call Rahul Gandhi uh, Shehzada. So I've been a bit too long, I'm sorry for that, but I hope the point to make is clear enough. We can see in the formative years of Modi's repertoire, of Modi's populist repertoire, the two sides of populism at work, fighting a minority that is seen as posing a threat to a majority, the Muslims, and fighting the establishment, the elite embodied, epitomized by the Nehru Gandhi family, not only because they are the establishment, but also because they are representing another minority, the Christians, and also because they are protecting the Muslims. And it's easier to transform fear into anger when you have the feeling that the rulers at the center are protecting a minority that is seen as uh, uh, yeah, posing some threat to the majority. So I think it's a case study that could um, somewhat throw some light on what has happened afterwards. 
Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Christoph. That was uh, great. You took us back to Gujarat. You know, uh, the way things have been going in India, I mean, we're so preoccupied with, uh, with uh, 2014 forwards uh, and then 2019 forwards that Gujarat now seems like ancient history uh, and it seldom enters the conversation anymore. Although, as you point out, a lot <laughs> that began there is now coming to fruition on a national stage. So it, it really was the kind of laboratory uh, and, and it's been uh, to our detriment that we have set aside uh, lessons that uh, were very clearly, uh, you know, spelt out from that those 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 first 15 years that uh, that uh, you know uh, this national dispensation was uh, you know trying out various uh, strategies in 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 Gujarat. Um, so thanks for that reminder. Um, I um, let's see. Uh, we have some questions here. Um, I think I think the point you made about if I may, uh, uh, kinds of populism, you know, one which is anti-elite and one which is against a specific minority community. And Modi's brilliance, in a sense, in being able to do that by having the Nehru Gandhi family and the Congress party combine those two kinds of descriptions. I mean, being highly elitist, but also, you know, being um, minority in various other ways, you know, partly Parsi, partly, you know, Kashmiri Pandit, partly Christian, Catholic, uh, all these different kind of things, uh, in addition to being, of course, wealthy, Anglophone, cosmopolitan, elitist, and um, uh, the kind of secular and supposedly pro-Muslim politics of the Congress party historically, you know, so so really just squishing together all those those different kinds of definitions of of the of the kind of uh, you know stigmatized other uh, in in an elite and in a community uh, or, or 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 at least in in some kind of broad uh, secular uh, entity you know which is which is not uh, not a Hindu one. Uh, that uh, that's I think quite a you know it's it's very useful and and a way of analyzing it and I think it's something one can actually really use uh, you know as a quick shorthand when thinking about you know why why this works so well uh, why it has worked so well for 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 Modi. So um, we have questions here and I must uh, give uh, due uh, consideration to them um, and. Uh, We'll start with um, uh, Kabbalan. Uh, so he's saying Kabbalan CL. I don't actually know who that is, but he has asked questions before in the morning. Uh, and the, the, the question in the one, the first question is, basically I'm summarizing a very long question. I think he's trying to suggest that if you look at populism, BJP style and and compared to populism DMK style, right? What is the difference there? And how does the DMK use its kind of Tamil populism or its non-Brahmin populism or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, to counteract the BJP's populism? Uh, and actually, you know, they managed to, to push back, uh, but with some other kind of populism. Now, So how do we describe that other Tamil, yeah. Tamil DMK style yeah. populism. And I would even extend this question and I can say, I would say arguably, I don't know, I could be wrong here, but that, you know, you can think of Mamata's populism also as a, as a kind of Bengali populism. And how is that functioning? And is it actually going to be able to withstand the BJP onslaught uh, in, in, in the current uh, ongoing election there that remains to be seen? Um, then the same person has another question. So I'll just uh, put it on the table. Um, yeah, so, you know, he's, he's taking up your point, which, uh, you know, which I, I personally also, you know, over the years made this list of words that 
uh, and the kind of language, you know, uh, in a Victor Klemperer kind of sense that, you know, how does Modi distort language? How does he use language? Let's not even say distort. How does he deploy it so effectively? You know, what are the kinds of expressions? So, um, uh, sorry, Ayodhya Thora Niche, huh? So, you know, you mentioned this Shahzada and this Italian, uh, you know, this Mem Sahib and this, you know, all, the, all these expressions which are highly communally marked, they are highly targeted. In the positive sense, we had Gujarati Asmita and, you know, um, uh, Gaurav Yatra and Hindu Hriday Samrat and all those kind of words. But then you also have these, you know, Persianate uh, words that he uses uh, for, uh, you know, we had uh, Ramzada and Haramzada and, uh, you know, th that, that, that also comes into it, Shehzada and all, all of these kind of things for the adversaries. Um, so this uh, Kabbalah second point is that, look, uh, even something like Khan Market Gang or Latians Delhi, you know, it's continuing that kind of a vocabulary of demonizing you know, whoever your adversary is, uh, which could be elites, which could be the Anglophones, which could be Christians and Muslims, which could be the seculars, etc., etc. And to this, we can add that whole list of libtards and seculars, and you know, all of the uh, of, of of the the first regime of the 2014 period. That, that was a very active kind of a uh, vocabulary. So. Um, is this part of, the question is, is this part of a universal trend among the rise of the right-wing majoritarian parties? Universal, I, I suppose this person means global, you know, applying certain terminologies to communalize political discourse. I think the answer is yes, but of course, you, you know, you should, you should uh, take that. The, then there's another question by Muhammad Osama. Hello, Professor Jafrullo. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> huh? How I do can you? Hear how do you see the relate? No, no. He says, "Hello, Professor Jaffer." Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, how do you see the relationship between populist affect? You know, the narrative of affect. He says, "Affectual narrative." I mm, think, mm, mm. Narrative of affect. I think. How do you see that narrative? What role does it play in getting reelected? Yeah. You know, uh, what kind of, I guess bonds are established between the populist leader and, and, and his, his constituency. And then, um, okay, so, so, okay, so take these and then there's another question. And then no, these are very good. These are very good questions indeed. And I, I will return to them in, in, in the order you have um, uh, listing them. Um, yes, uh, populism, <laughs> as so many varieties. In fact, uh, in, in the end book on populism, uh, co-edited by uh, Paul Taggart and others, with Ristilin, we have one chapter on varieties of populism in India. And we do uh, devote several sections on uh, you, what you can say regional, what, we, what you can call regional populisms. Uh, you mentioned uh, Mamta uh, Ananya, uh, Kabilan mentions uh, DMK. Uh, yes, we, we, we could add uh, others, definitely. Uh, and incidentally, some other um, scholars have also spoken about uh, uh, agrarian populism. Uh, for, for describing what Charan Singh did in the 70s, 80s, for instance. What, wh why is it relevant? It is relevant because most of the time these um, leaders, ideologues, try to blur class differentiations by resorting to an identity that would be in that in that case, all encompassing, you know, you, you are Dravidian first and from a low caste uh, second. Uh, you're a Kisan first and a landless peasant second. And that's why, by the way, uh, Narendra Subramaniam has also written a book on uh, populist uh, Dravidianism, uh, this defining Dravidianism as populism. 
for me, it's perfectly um, consistent with the idea that under this word populism, there are so many different variants. But I would be more specific. For me, these forms of populism are usually what Ernesto Laclau uh, and Chantal Mouffe would call populist of the left. You know, populist of the left, which means that you are fighting elites, certainly. And, and you're blurring differentiation within the people, but for fighting elite more effectively. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, political parties in Europe these days, Podemos, for instance, or the Five Star Party in Italy, Podemos is in Spain, which, which say, well, class politics is over. We need to use other repertoires for bringing the people together against the elite. And this is a progressive brand of populism. Because usually populist of the left delivers somewhat. Populist of the right never don't deliver in, in terms of uh, social or socioeconomic redistribution. So that's that's what I would I, I would say in response to to this um, very good point. And and uh, again, uh, if you're interested, the chapter we did on populisms in India with Louis Tillin in the Oxford Handbook on Populism uh, review uh, many of these uh, cases. Language matters. Oh yes, it does. And that's why I cite Modi at length as much as I can. You know, we need to hear his voice for understanding what is the strategy. We need to have a glossary. You know, uh, I've done this, of course, in my next book, you will see long citations as well. Sometimes you need three pages. You know, there is a fabulous, extraordinary discourse in uh, Moradabad, 2017 justifying demonetization. Every word matters. He doesn't say much about the way he coins formulas. There is one very interesting interview with Shekhar Gupta, 2013 or 2014, when he says, I'm for sarcasm. So I am for, it means, under the belly kind of attacks. All, all populist leaders are. You know, Bolsonaro does it. Uh, of course, Trump did it. Duterte does it. Uh, Erdogan does it. But I would say there is something more. It, not only they use sarcasms, they, they have to use this kind of uh, disruptive discourse uh, to, to fight to fight the, the elite by distorting language, to fight them in such a way that they claim to be that different from them, that they just don't speak even the same language. But I would add to this that they also use body language. Body language plays a huge role in populist repertoires. They would, they would show their muscle. They would have this 56 inch kind of myth. They would have uh, the uh, AK-47 in their hands when they'll be patrolling uh, and Duterte will, will, will show that he can uh, kill drug traffickers himself and so on and so forth. So it's a completely different language of politics in terms of words, in terms of behavior. And of course, they are always ahead, you know, those who, are so civilized, so polite, so uh, cast in the mold of parliamentarism, for instance, are taken aback. And, and that's why there is a real difference between the populism of Elke Advani and the populism of Narendra Modi. Elke Advani spent decades in parliament and he has been shaped by an ethos, a language of politics that is now crumbling down, that is destroyed on purpose. It should not be the language for a civilized exchanges. If, if you read the book by Levitsky and Ziblatt, Our Democracy Dies or Our Democracies Die, you have 
a very interesting explanation of why the first casualty of populism is parliamentarism. Because a parliament is the place where you exchange ideas. They just don't want to exchange ideas. Ideas have to die. So language matters indeed, <laughs> to a great extent. Um, the, the, the question um, that came about um, the use of affects for being re-elected. Yes, definitely. And, and, and this is, I think, why you can, or, or how you can distinguish, distinguish a, a populist of, of the right and a populist of, of the left. A populist of the left will have somewhat delivered in terms of socioeconomic redistribution. Hmm? Uh, Peron in Argentina was probably the first populist of the left. He gave something to the poor. In terms of rights, in terms of socioeconomic benefits, a populist of the rights will not redistribute but play on affects. The 2019 election campaign in India is, is really an interesting case study for that. We see impoverishment in village India. You know, the, the NSS survey uh, that leaked in 2019 showed that the percentage of poor increased for the first time since the 70s. NREGA was a collateral casualty of this uh, very conservative politics. Still, he wins a majority, I mean, in North India, of the peasants' voters, I mean, of the rural constituencies. Why? Because of the play, I would, of the way he played on, on, on emotions, you know. Politics, I call that politics of dignity. You have Swaraj Bharat, you have the Jandan Yojna, you have the uh, Udval Yojna, well, you can't have any refill for the gas cylinder, but he gave you one to you. And this is something you understand if you, if you listen to Man Kibat. You know, Man Kibat every month is a way to speak to the poor and to say, I am listening to you. I respect you. You are my uh, guide in a way. So this is indeed a play on emotion the kind of self-respect and this and this is a word that he uses repeatedly you, you look at the um 15th of august addresses uh, it's all about um self-respect uh, dignity uh, that's emotional you know it's exactly why you can be re-elected in spite of not delivering and the face of the prime minister is on each gas cylinder, is on each uh, vaccine certificate. That's that's the 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 the, the populist at his best. I mean, in in, in a systematic um, uh, action, but not giving resources and 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 inequalities increase. Inequalities uh, are what populism is supposed to. Do. To diffuse precisely. You need the populist when when you are uh, a chronic capitalist. You need you need the populist for diffusing anger, because he will find a way to tame the poor by convincing the poor that it's good for him. And that that's in fact very similar to what Nilander, uh, sorry, Nilajan Sirkar calls Vishwas politics. Um, you politics of belief in a way. Sorry, I've been a bit too long and, and we are now very, very much behind the schedule. That's, that's all right. Actually, um, uh, Peter D'Souza, uh, your friend and uh, uh, Hi, Peter. Time, uh, long Hi. colleague, uh, he has a question, but I'm going to, since he's on Zoom, I'm just going to let him ask it. Um, uh, yeah, please go ahead, Peter. And then actually we had some other questions, but first I want Peter to, to go ahead and ask. Thank you, thank you, Christoph. I really, I really enjoyed your presentation, and particularly the two attributes of populism that you set out. But what listening to you, I was wondering whether much of the much of the formidable facts that you 
presented as confirmation of that conceptual framework uh, were, were actually facts that, that you were fitting into the framework. I, was, I got the feeling that the framework was holding your analysis back. Now this is this this is a provocative statement because uh, let me let me now make that case. You see, if you did not uh, use populism in terms of national populism or anti-elite populism, but just used the simpler framework that one can derive from Max Weber, which is uh, the, the presence of the demagogue who speaks speaks to to his his or her audience over the heads of institutions, what he calls the plebiscitary leader, right? And, and who is a plebiscitary leader? One who is able to build a relationship with his audience, who experiences distress. And the word distress is very important. Distress and that he, he elaborates distress, economic, social, and psychological. So, so, so basically what you what you, all these, strategies that you mentioned uh, populists use are basically demagogic strategies to build that relationship of devotion with the audience. One doesn't have to use a, uh, you know, a theory of anti-elitist populism or anti-nationalist populism. These are all strategies and, and, and the strategies would be many which may not fit into this, this uh, two-part typology that you've built up. I mean it's, it's classic Weber plebiscitary leadership. And, and, you can, and it applies to all the cases, whether you talk of Erdogan, whether you talk of Duterte, whether you talk of uh, you know, the, the high quality populists or the, the average uh, Boris Johnson or, or uh, you know, Marie Le Pen and you know, all, all the others. What are they doing? They are playing to a sense of distress. And, and, that dis and so what they do is they, they, are, they tell their audience, that in a situation of distress, I am the savior. I will solve your problems by offering a very simple explanation of a very complex reality. So I, I'm wondering whether your, your, your framework is holding your analysis back because your data is formidable. Uh, the, the, uh, a, a lot of it is, uh, you know, I mean, it's very powerful, but, but by forcing it into these two parts, we are, miss, we are missing out on a larger story of why does populism work? You've told us how it works. But why does it work? Why does it have a receptive audience? Why do people, why does the BJP vote plan go up from 18.8% to 37.36%? Yeah, but this is, this is precisely the point. What do we, why do we need um, populism as, as a concept? Because it's a strategy, as you say, that creates constituencies. And uh, create distress. No, what was the distress of the elite, uh, I mean, uh, at least upper caste who supported Modi in the first place? Uh, you can say that they could be worried. And I think one of the reasons, if, if you want to find explanations for the success of BGP, one of the reasons why the fear of the rise of obesities, the, the, the insecurity uh, that made this constituency almost almost ready for him, but it, it created the feeling of distress, if you want. I, I prefer victimization, but it is the same. You know, it's a strategy for creating fear and to transform fear into anger, as I said. So I I I, I do think that we need to look at the politics of it. It's a it's a political strategy that is very well oiled and incidentally i've not mentioned that but there are pr firms behind this you know apco worldwide was asked to uh, design the discourses to design the strategy uh, and, and they and they are selling their their, their kit uh, across the globe to all those who need to to speak to their people and and play on their on, on their feelings of vulnerability so at the same time i'm 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 prepared to, to replace populists by demagogues, you know, the, the, the populists are certainly demagogues, but, but demagogues did not necessarily mobilize such a wide range of techniques. Uh, 
one thing in populism that is very specific is the communication techniques. I, I have not elaborated of that. I, I have all, all, only mentioned the uh, yatras and so on. Think about holograms, think about masks, think about uh, the modi kurta. Uh, you know, it's a very systematic range of techniques. Demagogues only speak in a way and promise. They do more than promise. They ask the people to identify with them. They are the people, you know. Uh, this is exactly what we heard in the 70s. India is India and India is India. This is populist of the left, but populist for sure. So, yeah, uh, but there is one notion. I thought I thought when you mentioned uh, Max Weber, um, uh, Peter, that you were about to, to speak about charisma because that's, that's a Weberian, but no, but that's a Weberian degree. That works very well in the case of the populist. You no, know, I, I was going to mention, in fact, yeah, it is the concept of charisma from which the idea of the demagogue and the plebiscite leader comes. Yeah, and and the, the section I quote actually is Weber's analysis of charismatic authority. Yeah, and that works very well uh, because we, we we think that charisma is necessarily virtuous, but for Weber, charis the charismatic leader is simply the exceptional man, the man who does something nobody else has done so far. And I think one of the main reasons why it works, because I, I try to respond to your question still, is precisely that Modi does things nobody has done before. You know, the pogrom, unprecedented since partition. Demonetization, wow, he did, he, he did it. He did it to do it. Uh, Balakot, of course, with a lot of media hype, something nobody had done before. Uh, abolition of Article 370, you know, every year there is something big, not something good, something big. And this, this boldness, the audacity is one of the mainstays for charisma. And, and incidentally, uh, Indira, Mrs. Gandhi was charismatic for similar reasons. You know, she, she tested in 74, she broke Pakistan in 71, she uh, annexed uh, Sikkim in 74. She declared the emergency and she could get away with it and be re-elected in 1980 because she was a strong woman. No boldness, again. And she's, she has entered in Indian history as a hero. When you see <laughs> all, all the bad reasons why she should not be a hero. <laughs> but. I, I, I do think that um, we, we, we have indeed a kind of type of politician that fits in these expectations of, of the Indian public. And, and, and the real mystery for me is why are these people above accountability? Why can't they be wrong, you know? And, and, and that's, that's probably more on the psychological side that you can find responses to that. Oh, but if I, uh, Ananya, just one last response. Yeah. You see, uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, read Weber's discussion of charismatic authority or charismatic personality, not in terms of exceptional qualities of the charismatic leader alone. I think what is central to his analysis and most, most commentators read it in terms of the exceptional you know, the Nietzschean uh, savior. Weber's reading of the charismatic authority is the relationship between the leader and the led. It is, a, it is the quality of the relationship, not the quality of capabilities. So, so you, you know, that's only half the story. Yeah. How, no. so, so when you have, when it is because of a situation of distress, that you can build that relationship. In a, if in a situation where there is no distress, you may have all the qualities, but you will not have a capacity to, to, to produce this kind of devotional following. Yeah. This relationship of devotion that yeah. produces the charismatic leader. Certainly. No, but th this is exactly why I mentioned Man Kibat, because uh, in, in, in Man Kibat, uh, you don't have the muscular modi. You have the if you want empathetic, um, what, uh, almost compassionate. Uh, you have the guru in a way. You, you don't have the fighter. 
you have another another side of 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 the personality of of the man so yes uh, that works it's not only in terms of uh, action but also in terms of the quality of the relationship indeed yeah thank you um actually christoph it's funny you you know your analysis of modi i mean i tomorrow i was going to actually you know present a, a kind of summary of my my chapter which is in this book and it's almost exactly the way in which you read modi you know looking at uh, his strategies of communication of affect of stigmatization of, of you know self presentation as a victim all these kind of things his language his media strategies uh, you know the spectacular nature of his politics the use of uh, systematic propaganda and pr social media all these kind of things um but i i do um, you know i do i do i th i think i think what Pe what peter is saying is also uh, germane in the sense that you know we and and this this takes us to a larger question which is all over the the public discussion for the last many years all over the world what is the exact relationship between the dictators the fascists the totalitarians the authoritarians of the 30s and 40s right and the sort of neo fascists extreme right populists of our time right are they the same yeah. are they different right do similar theories of 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 charisma of authority of 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 uh, communication etc work in the two instances or is there something from that playbook that is used today but then there are new possibilities because of new interfaces between the public and and the leadership you know um, all these questions uh, i think it's good that you know we disagree because that's the only way to push forward in our analysis instead of really? producing <laughs> you know uh, something which is historically uh, you know dissimilar uh, it, it seems similar at first but then you know you it turns out that in the details it's actually very different uh, and so no it's not a replay uh, you know of 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 hitler and mussolini it's something else but what is that right it's not you know mustafa kemal uh, you know atatürk uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, indira gandhi uh, you know but but modi is something else and erdogan is something else you know although in, in theory you could say all of them are are um, are uh, populists right so what you know what is different there and why is that meaningful and important for us to understand as as students of the political i think that's very very uh, key and i'm glad that peter you you resisted <laughs> the very persuasive and very detailed argument that uh, that christoph makes it's hard to resist christoph i have to say uh, but peter you're uh, even harder to resist perhaps just, uh, just to respond in one sentence and then yeah on this comparison with the fascist today's populist face voters in still a multi party kind of competition everywhere even even in russia they have to vote of course this is the most unfair election but still that's a, a big difference with with uh, the nazi germany and 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 fascist italy and 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 we have to wonder why do they need the mandate of the people Yeah. because they are populists <laughs> um uh, sorry i just actually we i'm not going to you know extend this much more but i just want to note the fact that uh, parvez alam again uh, asked a couple of questions you know one earlier when mujib was speaking and then one now when you're speaking uh, earlier he asked uh, and actually i think that's an interesting question for me it's very interesting but yeah. we can come back to it tomorrow so he, you know in some sense the term bahujan right actually means something like the mass of people right most people or you know the, the totality of the people the plurality of the people and that signifies a real question you know a real majority in some sense right now he says why is it that people are not voting for leaders 
who reflect bahujan aspirations but you you know you have to see that term in two ways like technically as 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 bahujan you know by caste and community and so on but also bahujan as literally signifying actually the mass of indians right who uh, intersect in various ways and probably combine numerically to form the largest majority like why why is this not something which is driving uh, populist politics in india or is it right so is the bjp not really about hindus but is it about the bahujans and you know how did we fail to see that i'm just extrapolating a lot from you know you're not you're not what he asked i'm i'm kind of riffing on that but i think that's i think it's a good question at least it is it I is you probably answered it in some of your books where well you i can only refer to to an article i did for the csds lok niti journal sip why do poor people vote more and more for bjp is the title and it's an interesting uh, question i mean it's a major question one of the responses i and i cut a long story short one of the uh, answers is because of reservations you've seen social economic differentiation within scs and obcs they don't form a block at all when jatavs will support bsp and yadavs will support sp the poor dalits who have not benefited from reservations will try to find other parties and bjp is very good at co-opting poor dalits who re who resent bsp's protection of jatavs and poor obcs who resent sp's defense of yadavs so they have been very very good at tapping the vote of the poorest of the poor and this is the paradox of reservations reservations as have divided dalits along socio economic lines and therefore the dream of 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 ambedkar is even more remote than it used to be he was already badly <laughs> it was so so badly affected by the fact that mongs and 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 chambars would never vote for him because he was a mahar well now not only they don't vote for rpi but they don't vote for rpi for good reasons and that's something we we need to address you muted you muted ananya i i'm going to have to uh... i'm muted am i no no uh, no no we are going to have to wrap up uh, actually there was one other point that that parvez uh, had put forward which was again interesting i think we should take it up tomorrow though um which was you know why why does bjp fear civil society activists foreign funded ngos this particular sector of uh, you know um uh, articulate citizens uh i think i think the answer is implicit in what you said that you know that's that's the fear of elites um and and uh, this elite can be highly globalized and networked all across the world which is is seen as a as a potential threat by by you know uh by the by the hindu right which has its own networks to counter those those uh, left networks etc those secular networks um those civil society movements so uh that that you know we we'll, we we'll let that be uh I, i there was one last thing i want to say when you were speaking uh christoph that you know somebody asked you about tamil and Beng, you know bengali na you know populism etc dravidian populism uh etc and i think um you know i i mean i immediately thought now i'm not a political scientist i have no technical you know understanding of these these categories but you know when you say nationalism and sub nationalism right and and are we talking about a kind of national populism versus a kind of you know parochial or regional populism and and you know is is that just like a sort of endlessly kind of fractal structure that you know you you, you can have smaller and smaller and smaller 
uh, kinds of uh, you know leadership to the point where you end up with like a cup panchayat right uh, where uh, literally the, the 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 populist is 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 you know the the, the village headman um and and you know is, is can this keep devolving in that way um this 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 kind of formation of communities that choose their their front man their strong man um and and does that ultimately hold out some hope for per perhaps undoing um you know the totalizing and authoritarian um uh, tendency of 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 populism and you know if you want to respond please do well just just a word because in the case of dravidianism and there is a very good book uh, that has just been published on the dravidian model um, by Kale Yarasan and, and, and his co-author. In the case of Dravidianism, you see how that is socially progressive. And that's why I, 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 I break it together with populist of the left, because uh, this is a way to form a block, to minimize socioeconomic differentiation in the name of an identity that gives results in terms of redistribution. And, and, and Tamil Nadu has been more egalitarian than most of the Indian states, probably because of this Dravidian, uh, I would say, repertoire. And at least that's what uh, the Dravidian model suggests. And I think that's, that's very much a good illustration of what can populism of the left bring to the table. Uh, that, that's why it's interesting to read Laclau again uh, and Chantal Mouffe again, because uh, this notion of uh, and Piketty these days, Piketty is more or less saying something similar. So um, we have to keep in mind that populism covers different variants and therefore uh, uh, we need to qualify it. And, and I keep looking at the populist of the right as national populist. That, that, that we, we have to be careful because uh, they are not at all of the same kind. Yeah. Okay. Well, Christoph, uh, you were supposed to, you know, we were supposed to give you half an hour. We ended up giving you yeah, sorry. an hour and 20 minutes, but, but uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, it's all good. Uh, and it, perhaps many of those things had been building up through the day and it was necessary to kind of have an open discussion. So I'm really, I'm really grateful to you for joining us. I know you're, I mean, I've, you seem to be perpetually in that same attic. Uh, I have, every time I've seen you. <laughs> I am. <laughs> know that France is having yet another lockdown and I, I, I can imagine it must be driving you crazy because, you know, so much is going on in India in terms of elections and all of this. Yeah, and yeah. You must really want to like get down into the field and get your hands uh, dirty with all, all the new data and so on. But, you know, uh, what to do. Uh, God willing, we'll get to see you uh, again yeah. tomorrow. So That's right. Friends, people who are listening, uh, people who are out there in this World Wide Web, um, we will return at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the 13th of April uh, at the same Zoom link on Facebook Live uh, for day two of our roundtable. And again, we'll have a number of really excellent speakers tomorrow. Uh, so please join us and thank you all for your patience and participation. Thank you so much. <laughs>